Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. And welcome to the Tuesday, August 1st, 2006, Walnut Creek City Council meeting. Will you please rise and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. Ms. Soles, will you please call the roll? Yes, Mayor Hicks. Council Member Skrell. Here. Council Member Regalia. Here. Council Member Abrams is absent. Mayor Pro Tem Rainey. Here. Mayor Hicks. Here. Next on the agenda, we have a very special presentation and a very special program, our Walnut Creek 2006 summer interns. Um, Look to find my notes here. Are they behind you? They, oh, they're hiding. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The genesis of the intern program came from a city council member, so it seems particularly relevant to recognize the interns in the council chambers. The summer intern program started in 1993 the brainchild of the late city council member, Ron Bagley, who wanted to create a meaningful forum for young people to learn about municipal government. Over time, the entire city council has strongly supported the summer intern program, recognizing its value to the city organization and to the individual interns. Nearly 300 Walnut Creek High School students have benefited from a city internship. This summer, we have 24 interns working in a wide range of departments and assignments, from the city clerk's office to open space to the police. In addition to working side by side with the city staff, the interns get together as a group once a week to participate in training sessions that broaden their understanding of city government, responsibilities as a city employee, and their role as a citizen. Class topics this summer have included a visit to the police station and a presentation by the creator of GetInsights.com, a website geared toward helping young people discover their career goals. Of course, no class is complete without a textbook. Our summer interns receive the handbook, During Your Part as a Student Intern, which provides the information about the city organization, workplace expectations, and etiquette and tips for making the most of the summer internship. Thanks to a partnership with the County Office of Education's Regional Occupational Program, interns are eligible to receive five high school elective credits for their summer job. That's on top of the paycheck, of course. The intern program is coordinated by our Youth and Family Services Coordinator, Renee Zimer, with assistance from Teen Recreation Specialist Lisa Gerloff and Office Specialist Cindy Hashimoto, R Renee, Lisa, and Cindy are all part of our Arts, Recreation, and Community Services Department. Our partners at the County Office of Education are Marie McClaskey, Director of Student Programs for ROP in Central County, and Sally Savage, Student Program Principal. Thank you, Renee, Lisa, and Cindy, Marie and Sally, and to all of the summer interns and their supervisors for making the summer intern program an ongoing success. Now, do we have all of those, first of all, all of those staff members here this evening? Renee and thank you. Renee's here. Come stand, stand, please. Mm -hmm. I want you to, if you would, come, come up. Are anyone, is anyone else here this evening from the County Office of Education? Or? Yes, I do. Come on, come on up. I want everyone to see you and to say thank you. Marie McClaskey and um, Sally Savage. And I know uh, we, through the city and our partnerships, our, our community and youth partnerships, we have often worked with the office, uh, County Office of uh, Education and uh, with Marie McClaskey over the years. Uh, and of course, um, in addition, Lisa works with our youth council 
our teen youth council youth council but represents the city um, and uh, do you have anything you'd like to say any of you about this wonderful program Introduce well, yourselves individually and come up to the mic. In uh, into the microphone, if you would, Marie, start over. I'm Marie McClaskey from the County Office of Education, and we're very appreciative of this partnership and the ability to help our young people look at careers before they leave high school and prepare for their future. So we really value this partnership. Thank you. Is that mic on? Is the mic on? Yes. <laughs> yes <it is. laughs> well, I would like to thank the city council for being so generous and, um, and funding this program. It's a wonderful opportunity for our teens here in the community. It gives them an introduction to the city, and it also gives them an opportunity to work a real job, a career-oriented job that they probably wouldn't be able to get otherwise. So I thank you, and I also want to thank all of the supervisors that um, come forward and eagerly um, apply for um, and request internships every year, and um, through their mentoring, um, our kids just learn so much and benefit so much from the program. So thank you all. And your name is? Renee Zimer, Youth and Family Services Coordinator. We really couldn't do it without you in terms of our youth and school partnerships. Thank you very much, Renee. Thank you. <laughs> and do any of the rest of you care to comment? No? From Lisa? <laughs> Lisa Gerloff, Youth Development Specialist here with the city. Um, working with the summer intern program just is another aspect of my job, working with the youth in the community. And every year, I'm always so greatly excited to meet new teens in the community. And I'm very excited to see everybody, the teens that come out, they really step up to the challenge and meet the expectations we give them and surprise. And we learn from them every summer as well. So, And are, are there any of them here this evening, Lisa? Any of the interns? Yes, there are in the audience. Could I ask all of the interns to please stand and be recognized? Thank you very, very much. And I, I see a few of the supervisors here this evening as well, and I appreciate you coming. And anyone else? Did you care to say anything? Okay. Well, all of you, thank you. It's a magnificent program, and I've heard from the supervisors how much they appreciate the extra help this summer. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on, next we have the consent calendar. Does anyone from the city council care to pull anything off the consent calendar? Yeah. I would move approval of the consent calendar. Second. Second. Thank you. And does anyone from the audience care to address the council on any item on the consent calendar? Okay. Seeing none, I will bring it back to the council. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Motion carries. Next on the agenda is public communications. And uh, I understand we have a number of people that would like to address us this evening. I wonder if I could just briefly ask our city attorney to comment on the limitations under the Brown Act in regards to any response that the council is able to give to public communications. Okay, well, one thing that's brought up that is not on the agenda, the council uh, can, can briefly uh, respond or ask staff to respond. Brown Act prohibits any kind of discussion or uh, decision making on any item that's, that's not on the agenda. Okay, thank you. And uh, under public communications, you would have three minutes. And if you would state your name and address, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Um, Mayor Hicks, council okay. members. I am Matt Bollinger, the project manager of the used oil recycling program. And it kind of feels funny to be out here, but <laughs> <Back there. laughs> the man behind the window. Um, <laughs> yes, I have a special friend who's came with me today from the Contra Costa Clean Water Program. This is, uh, of course, Mr. Funnelhead. He's our, our mascot for the school education program, which we do uh, 35 schools a year with. And we're, we're really excited to be here tonight because uh, we have a special uh, achievement award for somebody and, of course, uh, some of the schools of Walnut Creek, which is very special. Keith Barlow, would you like to say a few words, Mr. Funnelhead? Uh, thank you. I know there's some perception sometimes that Matt is actually Mr. Funnelhead, but 
Uh, you may, some of you may know me as the executive director of Diablo Light Opera Company, but I also have a double life. For the last nine years, I have played Mr. Funnelhead to over 100,000 young kids in Contra Costa County, second to fifth graders. And I think that makes me qualified to say mm -hmm. thank you very much for your support of this program. And I know the kids love the show. I wouldn't be doing, have been doing it for this long if I didn't believe in the, flow, in the program. Uh, so I just wanted to take a moment to sort of <laughs> show you the man behind the mask and thank you for your support. Well, thank you. Well, of thank course. You. Uh, yeah. And I would say that um, we have guessed as to who's behind <laughs> Mr. Funnelhead. And Mr. Funnelhead always comes to the annual creek cleanup. And I will have to admit that I have hugged and been hugged by Mr. Funnelhead. <laughs> I have no oh, idea who he bad, was. Bad, so. bad, bad. <laughs> He's the hugger. <laughs> I haven't explained <laughs> what it is he does as Mr. Funnel. What is it that you do? What do you do as Mr. Funnelhead? Besides Think hugging. Right. Well, <laughs> we, we perform a 40-minute show at assemblies at grammar schools all around Contra Costa County, which educate kids on uh, recycling, specifically uh, oil recycling, that it's free, easy, and cool to recycle oil. And we know that they don't change their oil yet, but we get the message out. We've been doing it for 10 years, so a lot of the kids that we've performed for know about recycling oil and we try to keep it from being poured down the gutter into the storm drain which is really the number one pollution problem in Contra Costa County is oil getting in the, into our water supply. So we teach them that and we talk about you know recycling cans, bottles and newspapers too, helping at home and at their school doing that as well. And they can relate a little more to that. And they have, we sing, we, uh, we change the uh, words to po popular songs and we sing and I, I won't say I dance cause, but, but I do try. Um, and we, 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 they really enjoy the show, and they're learning while they're having fun. So that's, that's pretty much it. Thank you. Great. And we've seen how much the kids enjoy and respond to Mr. Funnelhead and the message. Well, the real special part about tonight is that, you know, we've had lots of winners over the last 10 years from the Magnet and Bumper Sticker Art Contest, which we achieved to have uh, $2,500 worth of prize money um, donated by the Contra Costa Clean Water Program so the kids could buy educational software, um, art studio type uh, software computers and one of our winners this year is actually from Bancroft Elementary who is in the audience tonight we have Shania Reynolds mm -hmm. Shania would you like to come up here and say a few yes. words we'd like to give you a special achievement award from wow. we have Mayor Hicks has actually signed it here yes. I'll have a little shot at the camera for people at home come on up here Shania we'd like to give you this special achievement award which Mayor Hicks has signed and from the city of Walnut Creek for your your beautiful artwork, which, uh, like I said, we have it actually right down on the, up here on the wall. Why don't you grab it there? Bring it over here. These are actually the three final winners of the artwork. She didn't win, win first prize. That was actually by a girl from Concord, but she got second prize. Here's the one in the middle that says, let's make our world a better place. Recycle oil. And it has a beautiful rainbow and a boat that's made like the globe, which is uh, very interesting. I, like I said, I think that's probably one of the most unique concepts we've seen since the, the inception of the program. So we, we really wanted to you know, have a special night for here in Walnut Creek because you did a great job in this program. Why don't you tell them a little bit about your artwork real quick. Tell them how you came up with such a great idea for that artwork. Okay. Um, I decided to do Mr. Funnelhead because I wanted to draw and so I drew a world but then um, I made it into a boat so Mr. Funnelhead could stand on it and then um, I drew a rainbow so the world would look nicer than with dirty oil all around it. <laughs> <laughs> And then I drew a blue sky so it could be a clear day, not so sad. And I drew it so people could look at it and know um, that after they recycle oil, that it would look like that. Very nice. Well, we'd like to thank you very much for your time tonight, and uh, we'll let you get back to your meeting. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Support over the years. Congratulations, Shania. Mm -hmm. Very proud of you for the work yes. you've done. And thank you, Mr. Funnelhead. We're proud of your work as well. <laughs> yes. And uh, Matt Bolander, 
carrying Mr. Funnelhead now. He is generally behind the scenes filming <laughs> our city council meetings Back on in that room. behalf of Channel 6, and uh, we're very pleased to have him here over the years as well. So thank you. Now next on to our regular format. <laughs> We have more public. That, that's what I mean. Oh, public oh. communications. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> Please step forward. Sorry for the delay. Okay. <coughs> Good evening, Mayor Hicks and Council members. <coughs> My name is Norm Baskin. <coughs> I'm the president of the Rossmore Table Tennis Club. As some of you may know, the Rossmore Table Tennis Club is 34 years old and holds the distinction of being the oldest continuously operating club within Rossmore. We have more than 130 members. Our membership is active. Our facility is used seven days a week from six in the morning to eight at night. <coughs> we also allow some of the 9,000 Rossmore residents access to use our facility and our equipment, an invitation that some 200 others regularly embrace. Until January 2006, we had two dedicated rooms at Creekside when the board closed our facility due to harmful mold. The board's decision was to make the Sierra Room available to us because for reasons of safety, the large event room is unsuitable. It is poorly lit, and the large size of the room forces us to chase errant balls around a large space. We also have to assemble and disassemble tables and rearrange them to order in order to accommodate other events at the Sierra Room. This might seem insignificant, but asking 65 to 90 year olds to chase balls <laughs> and play in a room with dim lighting and lift and push tables is unacceptable <coughs> when there's an alternative and better solution. On top of this, our schedule is not our own ours to determine. On at least 10 occasions, we have come to the Sierra Room only to learn that the table tennis schedule for the day has been shoved aside in favor of meetings. The oldest and one of the largest clubs in Rossmore simply has no control over its own schedule. The facility that has been temporarily assigned to, nor is that facility adequate for our needs, even temporarily. We are here tonight to ask the council for a quick action. We've been looked out of an acceptable, locked out of an acceptable facility for six months and little or no remedial action has been taken to accommodate the table tennis club and more than 330 people who play regularly. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And we do have copies of your, of your comments. Yes, you do. Thank you. And next speaker. Um, good evening, I'm Connie Mitchell, also a member of the table tennis club. And I have been living in Rossmore for a little over eight years. I'm here before you this evening to plead for a favorable and expeditious resolution in the matter of the installation of the temporary trailers, which we had requested. As I understand it, the request was approved for the table tennis trailer, but it cannot be acted upon because it has been submitted in a so-called package with the other trailers, which were denied because of unresolved property lines, complications. It is obvious that new submissions of our request will involve a lot of additional time, and we are hoping that you will find a way to separate the table tennis package from the others and permit us to proceed without much more delay. We feel too much time has been lost already. The folks in the audience wearing the red shirts represent a small cross-section of our table tennis players men and women ranging in ages from middle 50s to very late 80s, the latter having been playing in Rossmore for almost 20 years, for whom time is very precious indeed. In closing, I wish to point out that for some, the playing of table tennis is a vital part of our physical and mental lifestyle, and that for some, playing is really a da daily exercise. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Mitch Ms. Mitchell. Next speaker. Uh, <coughs> good evening, Mayor Hicks, council members. My name is David Kwok. I have been a Rossmore resident for almost eight years. The secure environment, the excellent facilities, organized activities, proximity to several major cities in California, truly make Rossmore a very attractive 
senior active adult community where old folks like us can enjoy our twilight years. As our club president indicated, we did have an excellent table tennis facilities in Rossmore and it's enviable to many of the other clubs which we hosted several times a year. We used to have two separate rooms in Creekside fully dedicated to table tennis. Unlike golf and tennis, these rooms were heavily used from 6 in the morning to 8 p.m. at night every day of the week. Unfortunately, we have been locked out of our table tennis room since January 17th of this year because of the toxic mold and health hazard, hazardous conditions. Our Golden Rain Foundation had requested your approval for installing six trailers in three different locations in Rossmore to temporarily house our staff and residents' activities. The foundation board is also actively working with an architect firm in Pleasanton to redevelop the condemned site. Hopefully, the construction can begin sometime next year. I understand that our request for these temporary trailers must be approved by your three departments, namely the planning commissions, the building department, and the engineering department. I also understand that your planning commission has given its approval of our request in May. Your building department has turned down our request for those two trailers for the Rossmore News in the Gateway parking lot because they are too close to the property line. Although this problem is being worked out, it could still take a couple more months yet. And then our request for all six trailers is packaged in one application, even though they will be installed in three separate locations. Your engineering department indicated that to divide them up, we will have to reapply for another site development permit. More delay. Now, a triple width trailer for table tennis has been available since April, and it is ready for installation in our Hillside Clubhouse parking lot as soon as the city of Warner Creek gave this approval. Seven months lockout without a satisfactory facilities for our 300 table tennis players in Rossmore is too much for anyone to bear. I just have two more sentences, oh, okay? Mm -hmm. The prospects of a yet another extended delay will create unnecessary hardship and deprivation which your council member can easily help to alleviate. We Rosmarians are loyal taxpayers and most of us support many of your city projects and election year, elections in Warner Creek. Perhaps you can approve the wide trailer application for table tennis first since it has already met all your stated conditions and requirements. I'm certain our management staff can and will continue to resolve those pending issues for the other five trailers. Thank you very much for your attention. All right, thank you. And uh, as I said, we can't really comment much on this, but I, uh, first of all, I have spoken to Steve Adams today and uh, we have agreed that we will have a meeting with uh, Mr. Adams and uh, Ms. O'Rourke and our building department. And uh, I also know that uh, our city staff has been working very hard to implement this. So I would like uh, Valerie Mar Baroni, our community development uh, director, to just comment briefly. But you can be assured that we are working uh, towards solution. Ms. Baroni. Good evening. Um, you've hit the main points. The city staff and the council have been working closely with Rossmore to try to resolve it. I would like to point out that the concern over the property line issue was raised by city staff to the Golden Rain Foundation in February. And they've been, they've, we've been in conversation with them about multiple options for how to resolve it, up to seven different options that we've been able to sort out. The regulation that's in question is actually a state building code. It's a state regulation. And um, the need to comply with the regulation exists. And so we've been working with alternatives for how to make that happen. And we are very interested in continuing to look at alternatives to facilitate um, possibly dividing it so that the trailers c causing the concern can be separated out um, and working those kinds of issues out. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. And you can be assured that uh, we will be meeting with Mr. Adams and we'll continue to work together in a positive way 
and uh, uh, I appreciate that Ms. Ms. Uh, Brony and others, uh, in fact, Mr. Barry Resto, you per perhaps could comment on this briefly as well in terms of the, the legal aspects of it. I know you've been working on it as well as city attorney. Okay. Yeah, I, th I think Valerie's covered it pretty well. And with property line issues, as, as far as I understand, uh, I mean, we've worked out a solution that's being worked on by, by Ross Moore now that mm -hmm. I don't think will take two months to resolve. It, okay. It's so going to take a matter of, there of days if, uh, sure. if documents are drawn up quickly. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, all of you, for coming Thanks. and expressing uh, your concerns this evening. Uh, just one other comment, and I know I talked to uh, Ms. Veroni about it, but uh, yeah, Donna Kaufman, uh, who chairs the uh, emergency preparedness at Rossmore, mm -hmm. their facility is also locked up uh, with the same problem. And so in those meetings, I, would, I, I know that uh, Valerie is aware of it, but uh, if you have meetings, uh, I would like her included, please. Okay, thank you. Anyone else want to come? Don't on? forget the Rossmore News. Oh, she, they've got that one already, yes. We've already started. Okay, does anyone else care to address the council on uh, public communications? Hello, yes, I'm Mary Furlong. Um, uh, thank you for inviting me or allowing me to come here to speak, Mrs. Uh, uh, Ms. Hicks and uh, council members. I'm here to talk to you about safety issues that concern the intersection at Ignatian Valley Road and um, San Carlos. Get the mic. There's a mic right there, yes. I would like to tell you first that as a walker, I live in Bancroft Village, and so I'm walking this sidewalk here, and I have to come up to this. If you could speak into the microphone. I have to come up. Could you start the timer over because I think we need to get adjusted here. So All right. Am I doing it right? I have to come up to this point on the sidewalk uh, and then make a cross at this intersection. Uh, there's a sign right here, that, a lovely sign that says um, 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 park. What's the name of the park? Heather Farms. Heather, Heather Farms. Thanks. Heather, Heather Farms Park. And when I'm standing here, I cannot see a car coming and making this turn, this right-hand turn, and I have tested this myself in an automobile, and he cannot see me either. And it doesn't s seem like that's true, but it is. The sign, it doesn't appear to be that tall. I'm 5'3", and, and I cannot be seen uh, on the, uh, from the car uh, coming around that corner, nor can I see the car coming. So the first time that I see the car is when I step into this intersection. That's the first time he sees me also. It's very, very dangerous. I have to go across that intersection over to this island to press the button to walk. Uh, when I do press the button and start across, uh, people are coming out of Heather Farms Park making left-hand turns this way. And um, because I walk a little bit uh, slower than they can drive, and they speed up, they cross in front of me as fast as they can. Sometimes I have to put up my hand to stop them for fear they're going to hit me. The same thing happens on the other side. When I'm coming across, when I get the walk sign and I start walking here, um, people are coming out of Heather Farms and making a turn ahead of me very often. There's nothing, uh, uh, no longer it's a uh, pedestrian right of way. It does not exist anymore. Uh, it's anyway, it's a very dangerous uh, um, place for walkers. A friend of mine was hit here. Walking from this side, uh, a car came out of Heather Farms. Uh, a woman was driving. She turned to uh, tend to her child in the back seat and turned around, and all of a sudden she was on top of my friend. Uh, my friend had a broken leg, and she would have, she was lucky to have only a broken leg. Uh, that's one issue. For pedestrians, it's a very dangerous intersection. Another issue is for, for automobiles. Automobiles uh, all have a green light. Uh, those going uh, north and those going south all have the green light. So people coming out of San Carlos are either making a left-hand turn or some of them are going straight into the park. Um, others are coming this way, making a, 
left-hand turn or going straight. They get to the center, and nobody knows who's going where. My, I have brought with me today, thank you, I brought with me today maybe 150 signatures at least, people who are very, very concerned about that intersection who say, please. Ms. Furlong, I'm sorry, you're addressing the council. I'm sorry. And your time is up, but. Okay, let me just say this one thing. Can't you please put up a turning light for people? At the intersection at Bancroft, it's beautiful. They have lights for each section of traffic, making a left-hand turn, and the others coming out of Bancroft, making a left-hand turn. And people have said to me, the reason they can't is because there's more traffic here on Bancroft. But I think we all need to realize there's a park here. There's a park. It's for children. And we cannot expect them to be that different. Thank you, Ms. Verlant. We have all of your comments and the maps, and I'd be happy to set up a meeting with you for further discussion. I would like that. Thank you so much. And I know you're talking out of concern. Thank you very much. We do have your contact information here. Thank you. Does anyone else care to address the council under public communication? All right, seeing none, we will close public communication. Move on to item 4A, under considerations, conceptual design, Walnut Creek Library downtown. And we have Rachel Lynchy, our city engineer here, who is a project manager. Computers thinking. Uh, my name is Rachel Lynchy. I am the engineering services manager for the city as well as the project manager for the library project. Um, great, good timing. Um, we were last here on June 20th with progress to date on the um, conceptual design. Uh, the conceptual design report was submitted to the city at the end of June. Uh, the summary, the executive summary of the conceptual design report was submitted with the, um, the agenda report and the full uh, conceptual design report is available as well. Um, city staff has uh, been reviewing and preparing comments on the conceptual design report which have been submitted to the architect. Uh, this evening we are bringing the re uh, final information on the conceptual design report to you which includes um, more progress and some refinement of what you had seen to date on the architectural work. Um, and actually, I'll scroll ahead here too. This is our what we're going to be talking to you about this evening. Um, as well as you'll hear from Swinerton Management and Consulting tonight to discuss the, um, the cost analysis and the project schedule. And as well as uh, they will talk through the process of the two independent cost estimates and the reconciliation and, and the technical meetings that uh, were conducted with respect to the project budget. So what we're seeking from the City Council this evening is additional input and feedback um, to take back to the project team to incorporate into the schematic design. We kicked off the schematic design uh, the mid part of July and, and work is underway and the technical meetings will be underway um, shortly. So any additional feedback and direction at this time would be um, helpful and appropriate so that we can move forward um, as expeditiously as possible. So with that, and there is an updated um, presentation for the City Council. Um, the, what went out with the packet was preliminary and so there is some corrected information available with, for the PowerPoint presentation. I will turn it over first to John Bakerton with Swinerton Management and Consulting, also here and later in the presentation. You'll hear from Don Merkus and David Schnee with Group 4. Thank you, Rachel. Before I go through the detail of the summary of the project budget and schedule, I want to kind of explain the process that we've been. Um, these, uh, the current snapshot in the project, we have uh, completed the conceptual design process, uh, and again, Don and David will present that after I speak. Um, it's important to, to understand the process we've gone through to develop this project budget. Uh, we've done two independent cost estimates 
Um, the first was done by Davis Langdon Associates, uh, who has worked with the group for a number of library projects. What's important here is that they're, they're estimating an approach. Uh, they know group four's approach to design, they know their projects, and they understand their, uh, uh, their approach to buildings. Uh, in addition to that, Swinerton Management Consulting did an, another independent estimate. Uh, our estimated approach is somewhat different from Davis Langdon, but equally important. We, do, uh, we base our estimates on real-time cost information and labor and materials, and we also work with subcontractors that we're currently working for. And where this is important is we, we are, we've been talking to the major trade contractors and looking ahead 18 months from that is seeing what the bidding climate is going to be, seeing what they think that uh, manpower and labor availability is going to be, and to try and be as accurate as possible in taking a look at what construction, construction costs are going to be when this project does go out to bid. After those two independent estimates were complete, we had a reconciliation process by which we lined the line, the two estimators sat down and reconciled the costs. Why is this important? In important projects like this, uh, we have found that the most accurate way of predicting or projecting costs, especially during the design process before projects go to bid, is by doing these independent estimates and then reconciling them. And we really kind of have a proven track record of doing this, working along with estimators such as Davis Langdon. We're going to perform this same process at three upcoming project milestones that I'll point out in a minute during the process of the project. Also, we've taken a look at uh, appropriate contingencies in our budget at this early phase of design, uh, design contingencies for changes which may occur during the remainder of the design process with the city and the library, construction contingencies to uh, take uh, into account unforeseen conditions during construction, and also uh, project soft costs, variables such as utility costs and permit costs. Uh, escalation has been a big issue, as many of you are aware. Uh, most people know about projects such as the Bay Bridge, although I think that's quite an extreme. But we've been very careful to take a thorough analysis and look at a projection what construction cost escalation might be during the course of this project. As many of you know, recently, very high escalation year to year has been taking place in the construction industry, primarily because of commodity costs, steel, concrete. That has cooled uh, somewhat over the last few years, and we project that that will, that will sort of uh, slow down as, as the next year or so progresses. Um, energy costs have continued to escalate, and so we have been careful to look at how an analysis of how that may impact this project. Uh, we also look at things such as labor agreements and market conditions, what the bidding climate is going to be a year and a half from now. So all those things have been taken into effect by, again, ourselves and the architect's estimator, and we will continue that process at three more project milestones during design. With that, I want to just give an overview of the project budget. Um, uh, this broken down as follows, library and site costs for the library site, temporary library and furniture, fixtures and equipment, and the totals are up there, uh, as you can see, 18.4 million. Uh, the parking, this includes the underground garage as well as surface parking, which you'll see in the design presentation, 9.5 million. Uh, contingencies, as I explained earlier, uh, for design, construction phases, and for project hard and soft costs, 3.5 million. Uh, escalation, uh, this includes, this uh, assumes a library and parking construction will start January 2008, and I'll kind of show a little bit of detail there also. And also project soft costs, these are design fees, city staff fees, construction management, and then permit costs, other costs such as permits, fees, and importantly, public art for the Walt City's public art program, 8.1 million. And of course, there's much more detail to this, but this just presents a summary of the project budget. <coughs> now moving on to project schedule. Um, the important thing in developing the project schedule has been to align the expectations of the design team, the city, library staff, and importantly, the community, so everyone understands what the project schedule is. In our work sessions with the project management team, we have looked at all, at, at all aspects of the, the site and the design. We've looked at site staging issues with traffic, uh, construction equipment, et cetera, project phasing, planning around the weather uh, so that we can minimize the delays due to weather. We've also looked at ways that we can expedite the schedule and get this library completed and delivered as soon as possible. This includes things like looking at doing more than one bid package and phasing bid packages. Um, and our recommendation actually is to do uh, some of this in order to, we think, save a, a few months on the project and have three bid packages. Uh, relocation of the temporary library, 
demolition of the existing library, and then finally building the parking garage and the library. We also looked at, at some other ways of, of making the process uh, uh, move more quickly. One thing we looked at, for example, was fast tracking the city approval process and trying to get city approvals as quickly as possible. Uh, during those discussions, recognizing the importance of this project to the community and to the city, that we think that having prudent review and approval processes at each project milestone is really important. And we're at one of those points now, and we'll have three more of those prior to construction. Um, and taking into account all those things, we uh, uh, basically we have come up with a recommended baseline schedule, which we are very comfortable with and confident about, and I wanted to review that briefly here. Um, you'll see that we're at the red dotted line on the diagram right there, uh, just finishing the conceptual design phase and just beginning the schematic design phase. And, and uh, I'll move on here to show some more detail here. Um, the key milestones for the design and construction and, and uh, most importantly approvals process is that we're again, we're at the end of conceptual design right now. We will be submitting the schematic design package, again, one of our milestones in November of this year. There will be a secondary design submittal called a design development submittal. That will be submitted in April of 2007. And then we have our various packages for bid. Uh, a temporary library bid package for relocating the library during construction will be in July of 2007, uh, un just under a year from now. Our demolition bid package will be issued in August. And then the primary one, the library and parking garage project, those that bid package will be issued in November of next year. And then following that is sort of a, 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 a final one, which is furniture and equipment, and that'll be in June of 2008 while the library is under construction. We want to point some key milestones for the city in addition to those we just, I just mentioned. Um, selecting the artist for the public art program will be October of this year. Confirming our procurement strategy, again, confirming how many different bid packages we will be having. That will be need to be determined in November 2006. Finalizing the, the parameters and the program for the temporary library in January of next year. And then our construction uh, milestones are, we'll start relocating the existing library in December 2007 doing the demolition of the existing library after the holiday season in January 2008, and then new construction starts in earnest for the parking garage and library in April 2008 with move in two years following that. And again, there's more detailed schedule, schedule information that you'll see, um, and uh, as we proceed with these reports as the project moves forward, we will go into more detail in some of these, in some of these, uh, these procedures and, and processes as well. And that I'll return it back to Rachel. Thanks. To Don. Right. Sorry. Um, good evening, Don Mercus, Group Four, the project manager. Um, we actually um, started con schematic design first of July, and so we submitted a report the end of June, and have actually started in schematic design, which is due at the end of November. Um, the detailed work that we're doing is, is listed up here, but it's continued refinement of the design, um, development of the exterior of the building, further definition of the landscaping, the structural systems, mechanical systems, the civil work for the building, as well as electri electrical work and um, structural work. Um, the process for schematic design is going to have continued participation, which will include city council presentations. We'll have a 50% schematic design presentation in September, um, as well as a final schematic design presentation in November. Our work with the library advisory team will also continue through schematic design with their next meeting in August, followed with a September presentation of 50% schematic design and also 100% schematic design in October. Um, continued integration of your commissions, which are relevant in reviewing and providing input to council of the project, will also be continued with the Design Review Commission presentation in September at 50% SD schematic design, as well as a presentation of the pros in October, and then the 100% schematic design to the Design Review Commission in October. As we just update you, the landscape plan is pretty much consistent with what we presented to you in June. Um, we have the um, Lincoln running along 
the right side of the screen here and Broadway running along the bottom of the screen. The real big goals for the project in terms of landscape um, is the integration of the park, uh, the library into the park, the extension of the park to the corner <coughs> of Lincoln and Broadway with the development of our South Plaza right here. We have the library arc or the park arc which really connects the South Plaza to the rest of the park along the back of the building here. We have a surface parking lot which has access down to the underground parking. We have access to the private property behind the library right here. We have four entries to the building. As I skip ahead here quickly. Um, one on each side of the building actually, one on the south side, one off of Broadway, one off the surface parking lot, and one off of the park. Um, looking at creating a library green which is really yet to be determined and will be determined as the park master plan is developed this na next year for Civic Park. Um, what this is showing in terms of the scope of the project is really a placeholder for perimeter integration into the park. The Civic Park master plan will really determine what will happen in the rest of the park as we look at the phase one diagram. This is what really defines the scope of work which is in the library project. Um, looking at opportunities for the skate rink, for overlooks for the creek overwalk, and other opportunities to integrate the library building into the park, into the Civic Master Plan, will occur over this next year as the Park Master Plan is further developed. Um, one of the things we wanted to summarize, just to make really clear, was the tree preservation diagram. Unfortunately, um, putting a 42,000 square foot library and 170 parking spaces onto the site will impact the trees. Um, we're currently having to look at uh, removing about 25 trees, but we are adding more than 45 trees back in. I think one of the most valuable trees, which is of significance that is being proposed to remove is the Valley Oak, which is located, let's see if I can get this right here in our surface parking lot, um, kind of behind the existing or the proposed parking ramp down to the underground parking. Um, based on the current program of the 170 parking spaces, the surface parking that we're able to get with this configuration, trying to preserve this tree would actually have significant impacts to the project. Um, we would have to um, add an additional 20, 15 to 20 spaces underground if we were to try and retain this tree. That would require us to further encroach into the park, which would then require the elimination of potentially two other trees in the park, as well as additional costs for the underground versus the surface parking that we would have to add, which would actually be in the, be in the millions of dollars. So um, unfortunately there are trade-offs in this development, um, but we think or we're trying our best we can to mitigate the, Im uh, the impacts of the trees and to retain the park-like atmosphere of the project. And as you look at some of the vignettes that we've developed for the landscape, I think this really demonstrates the character and opportunity to really integrate the library into the Civic Park Master Plan. As we look at this view, which is from the gazebo, looking back at the new library, you can see the actual extension of the park. The current, uh, the line of the current tennis courts, let's see here, actually occurs right about here. So we're actually gaining park space on the north side as we're eliminating the tennis courts and extending the park into the building on this side. Um, and it shows the example of the opportunity to really have the landscape extend the park along the back of the building as well as the front of the building. Uh, this vignette is actually of the South Plaza, and it really again demonstrates one of the goals, which is to extend the park to Lincoln and Broadway, and really not to have, even though we're going to be on a deck over underground parking, the intent is really to have a park-like feel of the surface parking lot as well as the South Plaza. And so the new entry to the park will be extended to uh, Broadway and Lincoln at the corner there. And we're going to move on to uh, presentation of the design which David will take you through. Thank you Don. 
And uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, members of council, for having us back again and uh, having this opportunity to show you the progress uh, that we've made and responses to the uh, excellent feedback we've gotten uh, received from you and members of the library advisory team. Uh, my presentation starts underground and then blossoms above ground, but starting here with the uh, garage plans, as you've seen it before, but important to uh, uh, remind the public uh, that we have a very efficient uh, underbuilding and under uh, ground parking deck uh, where uh, the ramp comes down, easy to circulate, and two uh, convenient entries, this uh, shown here, which takes you up to the library and conveniently to uh, the corner of Lincoln uh, and uh, Broadway, and on the north side, also a convenient uh, direct elevator and stair access uh, to the rest of the park and the uh, senior center and uh, uh, meeting room uh, and community center spaces there. So a very efficient uh, library, which will also be in schematic design, looking how to put uh, st uh, storage and mechanical room spaces, and we believe we'll be able to find uh, friends at the library storage room space uh, downstairs as well as on the first floor. Now getting to uh, come above ground. Now we have the floor plan uh, that we've worked very hard uh, over the uh, conceptual design phases to uh, create a, a library that will uh, beautifully fit into the park and uh, uh, really enhance the park but be a practical and functional library and we really feel we've achieved that. And your comments uh, last time we presented that I think really uh, confirmed that we're on the right track. Uh, the library, uh, just very briefly for uh, people who hadn't seen it before who are watching, has uh, again uh, Broadway uh, on the bottom of the screen north to the left, has convenient entries both from uh, the street and from the surface parking. And if you were to come up from the garage, the first entry I had shown in the previous slide, has you coming up uh, both to exit out to the library arc and to the street or to the park or straight into the library. And the uh, south end of the building, the section to the right, are the uh, browsing and convenient areas and the lovely cafe which can operate uh, before uh, library hours for morning park users and strollers and uh, to get a cup of coffee and that can operate uh, separately if desired from the rest of the library. Uh, having your fiction uh, areas and then a, a lovely uh, and uh, really large children's area with a, the early readers and childhood story time in its own little wing uh, with its own garden off to the side. And of course with these two entries on the south we have uh, per your direction uh, a park entry that really uh, embraces the park with a uh, what we call a boulevard of the spine linking north and south and connecting library users inside and outside. Moving up to the second floor, uh, the library has uh, more adult and teen spaces and uh, reference collections. Again, it's organized along uh, this main boulevard connecting people from the lobby to the park with great views. There are a series of uh, three decks, uh, one on the south overlooking the uh, library uh, plaza and entry plaza with views out towards the creek. A second one from uh, the periodical section uh, complete with uh, adjacent to a fireplace and views out into the mature trees which was uh, something that was really appreciated and a lot of community feedback uh, from as early uh, long back as the uh, design, public design competition, and then a third deck uh, overlooking the uh, park entry. Uh, we have the teen area, as I said before, computers and seating uh, along the main uh, uh, boulevard or even Great Hall, as you might call it, uh, and uh, adult nonfiction areas upstairs. And of course, on the south side are the divisible meeting rooms and conference rooms, which have the ability to uh, be segregated for uh, independent use and really getting the most flexibility uh, for the city and the library to serve the diverse needs of the community. So all in all, this is going to be just a fantastic realization of the uh, program and vision that this community has had for uh, expanded library service. Uh, now uh, we start showing you uh, where some of our refinements uh, have been made. Uh, some of the comments uh, made in this last session and through the library advisory team were uh, trying to seek uh, some refinements and clarifications to how we were primarily looking at roofs and uh, we have uh, looked at those again and feel we're on the way to making some additional uh, uh, progress there and uh, look forward to getting additional uh, confirmation and comments from you on this tonight. Here we see a, a roof diagram where we're developing a, uh, a pleasant uh, symmetry uh, from the south end and the north end where we have a combination of, of sloped roofs and flat roofs. Uh, 
we also uh, previously had shown the children's wing uh, having a sloped roof and it was uh, interfering with some of the views from the north end of the building on the second floor. Uh, we feel the oh, flat roof here helps clarify and simplify the, uh, the gentle arc shapes of the uh, roofs on the uh, uh, main uh, body of the building with, and it gives an opportunity for uh, lovely and even playful skylights over the children's wing. Uh, what you uh, also see in, uh, here is that we're picking up the curves of the, uh, of the site that helps the building fit nicely into the park and it's a theme that we're trying to develop further and you'll see in a couple of other image, images. And another thing to point out is from uh, a session, we had two sessions ago where we were discussing design values and how to balance fitting into the park but having a, a pleasant amount of civic presence. Uh, we've created a, a higher roof section over the lobby which acts as an anchor and a beacon that helps people see uh, that the library is there, is a civic building, actually uh, it will be lit up uh, at night and welcome people in. And it's something that you would see in the general proximity of it and you'll see that uh, further as we talk, look at the elevation views and vignettes. First, briefly, a tour of the interior. These are images you've seen before. This is uh, standing at the second floor looking north to the park. You can see the gazebo through uh, these windows, the staircase that connects the park entry uh, to the park and the expanded uh, uh, lawn area, the uh, library lawn. This is the view from the south in the uh, popular browsing areas looking out to the cafe. Uh, the cafe would be here and this having uh, just really attractive uh, areas to come and see the newest and popular collections with seating. Uh, going right upstairs from there, here is uh, part of the uh, meeting room where we'll be having uh, presentations of uh, popular uh, lectures and authors and uh, community groups meeting, uh, divisible full AV and with the decks that uh, look out towards the creek and towards the street. Um, the periodical section on the second floor, uh, we had great responses to having uh, a variety of spaces, a magical children's area, but also a place for uh, adults to come and sit uh, by a fireplace. And we've uh, successfully incorporated fireplaces in a number of our uh, projects. And here uh, we can have uh, comfortable seating uh, and views out into the trees. Now we see how some of the uh, other comments are refined. Here we're looking at uh, a slightly new perspective of a similar view of the south side of the building. Comments uh, were made about uh, the forms of the roof and perhaps it being uh, too angular uh, before. And, uh, we thought in the spirit of uh, how this plan was developing and responding to the library arc on the east side and how to let the, li the park uh, come around on Broadway all the way to the south uh, the curves were generating there. We thought that would be a lovely uh, motif to continue in the three dimensions of the building and its elevations and roof. And what you see, and it's very subtle here, is a gentle uh, arcing roof form here where we had it angular before, we have a gentle arc. And you'll see in a few slides later how that is diagrammed as, as we cut the building in half just to illustrate how the forms work. And I think there was some uh, discussion uh, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, uh, Rainey about uh, roof forms uh, matching and uh, responding to her and in, in the roof plan there's the symmetry and it's a rotational symmetry about the lobby and the beacon where as we see it close up we have this arcing roof uh, to the right side. When you come around from the park side you have this arcing from the left seen from a distance as you approach at these two arcs uh, really uh, organize the building and create just uh, a lovely balance that uh, we think people will really like and help reinforce the organization of the building. Another comment we had was that uh, perhaps we had too many materials and uh, truthfully at the early stage we were at there we were experimenting with a variety of materials and had sort of put them in as a process of uh, elimination and looking at what are the best materials that we think are fitting to the park uh, that will give it civic character and uh, also enduring quality. We believe the material palette should focus down with the primary uh, being a uh, plasters in stucco and warm colors, brick uh, in, uh, that will match some of the buildings and uh, in the area that are distinctive to Walnut Creek and wood panels to give it the extra park uh, feel. And we'll be working in schematic design to uh, uh, select uh, the specific colors and textures of all of these things. But simplifying that as the primary palette on the exterior, possibly bringing stone as accents on the interior for floors or select walls. These are uh, items that we'll refine in the future. And as you, we look at this, we see, uh, of course, opportunities through to create trellises and to bring uh, the landscape right up to the building and onto the building as well. 
here's our view, uh, a watercolor done of the north side looking from uh, right along Broadway. Uh, this as uh, as approximately where the cursor is moving is where the, um, excuse me, the tennis court fencing is presently. So we're really through this building enhancing uh, the park by extending it up to the building. Here we see the, uh, as I was describing a moment ago, the uh, opposite and symmetrical curve of the roof. What these uh, roof forms do by not, uh, by being one half of a curve on each side, this creates the opportunity for clear story windows. These are high uh, windows similar to transoms you might see in uh, older buildings that allow light to come in. It's a very practical and energy uh, efficient way to bring light into uh, the building and uh, as part of our sustainability and daylight strategy uh, for the building. So these clear stories uh, that come from the stepped heights of the two roofs are a strategy throughout uh, the whole building. Now I'm going to, we have an animation that will show you a little fly through. Its uh, qualities and textures are a little bit harsh. That's the result of the uh, computer technology. It allows us to see certain things, but please take a, a little bit of liberty with uh, some of the details and a little bit of the uh, jitteriness of this. I'm gonna run through it once quickly, and then I'll run through it again, pausing with some comments. It runs about uh, 30 seconds, I believe. 60 seconds? 60 seconds, it, it, it took our computers uh, three days to generate. <laughs> It's never been so quiet in here. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll do the, if Mr. Fonald can sing, so can I, but I, I won't. But I'll give you running commentary in a minute. Let's see, we'll run it again and now I'll pause it uh, periodically <laughs> and we can comment on it. Uh, first of all, as we're going here, it's worth uh, commenting that we're missing uh, somewhere between a dozen to 20 existing trees that aren't in the model here. So we're approaching from Broadway, uh, from the north side, heading south. Uh, this is the uh, new library green, so the edge of the tennis courts is about here. There are a number of existing trees uh, that will be ma maintained in this area uh, and that we've already passed through and new trees added here. So the qualities of the park uh, will only be enhanced in future renderings. We'll try to uh, get those there as well. Could you please point out the senior center? Oh uh, yes, and the senior center is right here for scale. Thank you. Maybe you could point out the ice rink too. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's actually, uh, it's a, a, a great comment. The, uh, there's a separate park master planning effort that's uh, going underway and the planning efforts of the library and the conceptual design uh, still present the opportunity for many variations and opportunities for the ice rink to be fulfilled. And we are keeping that as a constant uh, requirement uh, to make sure that in our work that that process has every opportunity to be fulfilled here. And so <laughs> indeed, uh, the, some of the existing trees provide some of the challenges that an ice rink will have to work around. But uh, this uh, lawn area the, is one of the areas that has been discussed as a possibility there. Oopsie Daisy, I'm sorry, you get to see this part again. Okay, so now we're approaching the sidewalk, how most will see it. Is the children's uh, patio there. Right, and it's a little brighter on our screens and perhaps uh, council member screens than what the public is able to see. And I'm not too sure if it's a direct digital feed to the television audience or whether it's just the camera on this screen. Uh, but in this shadowy uh, area is actually a, uh, a dappled, sun-shaded uh, children's wing and patio, which will uh, be landscaped. We can see briefly, and you'll see as we fly by, the pattern of uh, 
uh, circular skylights we're considering uh, to bring light in and a little bit of playfulness. Uh, it, their questions were, what does it, the library look like from uh, Broadway? An excellent question. You'll see the library in motion uh, as you uh, approach it from the north or the south. Uh, there isn't a straight on view. And of course, one of the things that's lovely about it are the mature sycamores and the other trees we'll see. And uh, so you see that the, you'll always be experiencing the library through the trees, see it better in winter uh, when the leaves are down. Uh, but how we're uh, developing uh, the exterior and expressions of the windows with wood panels panels and uh, uh, framing of the windows and two-story uh, expression. Here is the uh, entry from Broadway uh, that connects through to the parking. Here is the full lobby and the uh, beacon uh, higher, highest roof element there. We're still working on the exact form and shape of it, but imagine this glowing at night. Uh, be nice. And now we're approaching to the south. This is generally the view you would get from the corner. Uh, you see the library uh, plaza and the cafe out here. There are a number of trees that aren't in the model yet that will, uh, as Don had said, uh, bring the park all the way down to the corner. Here's the uh, arc, the park arc, uh, the uh, drop off here. Uh, and this is the edge of the creek and we haven't because it would have taken our model another three days to render uh, the rich vegetation along the creek. Uh, we'll really, as you approach this, you'll clearly see as you do today, the creek in the distance. So now we're approaching along the library arc uh, passing the cafe and approaching the entry. This is the uh, stairway down from the garage where people can come out and uh, proceed to the corner and go uh, uh, downtown or uh, come out here and come to the park uh, in the senior center uh, this way. This is the staff bar, as we call it, the mostly uh, uh, behind the scenes spaces, but still has opportunities for the exterior to be attractively done. Uh, the second deck looking right into this tree canopy is here with its fireplace. Uh, the entry is being defined and uh, by these trellises. The book drops uh, convenient to the exterior for very efficient operations and we come in and the light streaming down from the beacon has us starting to look up. We haven't furnished the interior yet in the model, but then we get uh, the view up and the opportunity here for public art hanging here is uh, quite significant. And before I move on, is there any uh, questions on the animation or would you like it played a, a third time? Okay, hopefully that's enough, great, thank you. Uh, so then uh, just a still view to see how the uh, uh, Broadway uh, elevation uh, would look and the uh, uh, beacon uh, highest roof element. Uh, this is the uh, entry from the uh, parking lot and the drop off uh, looking west. And again, the same elements. And here is the just the uh, diagram showing the concept for the arcing uh, roof forms and the flat roofs beside it. And with that, I'll turn it back to uh, Dawn and I'll be after her uh, comments available to come back up and uh, respond or listen to any comments. Thank you. Okay, um, just an update on the sustainable approach to the building. As we reported to you last time, we are using the LEED matrix as an organizational tool to kind of track our sustainable um, design um, criteria that we are including in the design of the project. Um, the light lead criteria covers the site sustainability, energy efficiency, resource use, reuse and recycling, healthy indoor environment, and innovation in public education. Um, in addition to the sustainability as a project goal, it's important to note that other uh, criteria that is critical to the project success is the functional library, um, operationally sustainable as well as energy efficiently sustainable, um, on time, on budget, design excellence, and to support and be integrated into Civic Park. As we look at um, kind of a, a current status where we are, um, based on the lead matrix, we currently are at 26 points. In order to be certified, um, we would need to be in the 26 to 32 points. But more importantly, um, what are we doing right now in the design to address sustainability and integrate it into the project is we're looking at um, controlling solar gain through roof overhangs, sunscreens, and interior shading. We're looking at a very extensive storm 
water management, bioswales for surface runoff and roof runoff. We're looking at reduction of heat islands by using of light colored concrete and light colored roofs, which is an energy star rated roof. We're looking at high energy performance glazing. Um, energy efficient heating and cooling, as well as the lighting. David kind of demonstrated in the section of the building. One of the things that helped develop the section of our building is the opportunity for daylight harvesting to create natural light in the interior of this building, which has the potential to be very dark um, because it's somewhat wide and to get light into the interior of the building is very important. We're looking at a raised floor system, not just for um, flexibility for power and data management, but also for air supply from the mechanical system, which then requires smaller mechanical units, smaller um, ducts, actually no ducts, because the plenum under the floor is supplying the heat and cooling to the library, which is then provided right where the people are and not from up above where the whole volume needs to be heated and cooled. Um, the infrastructure will be um, installed in the library for future photovoltaic installation. However, it's not part of the project right now, but we will make it PV ready. And looking at um, inclusions in the specification for construction waste management and use of materials that have recycled content and are regionally manufactured or uh, fabricated. So that's just kind of current summary of where we are. And this, we will be using the lead matrix throughout schematic, through the end of schematic design, which will then kind of um, set the goals for the rest of the project, but wouldn't be tracked from then on for the project. So that concludes our design presentation, project budget, and schedule. And we're available for questions. Thank you very much. And it was wonderful to see that kind of 3D moving um, yeah. show so that we can all get an idea of the uh, kind of in-depth view of, of the building. Um, modern technology is wonderful. Does any, uh, do any of the council members have questions? Start, Ms. Rainey, uh, of whom? <laughs> um, <laughs> Mr. Mr. Don Yerkes or David? Okay, let's talk about the roof again. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think you, you really responded very well. Uh, the, when in our little mini subcommittee where we met and we discussed, you know, this beacon mm -hmm. thingy, I, it, when I first got my packet and it wasn't in the preliminary, broke my heart. Um, so I'm very pleased to see it. But my concern is the hat on it. Mm -hmm. Um... Can it, uh, it, you said you're still kind of working on that concept. Can you, and is there some reason, and it could be solar and that it would just, you know, turn into a little oven if it were glass up there. But it, the, the hat bothers me. It's uh, an excellent critique. That uh, phrase has been used in our office. Uh, and uh, They called me. Yeah, well, the trick is uh, the problem with uh, the hat as a metaphor is it's removable. It's not integrated to it. We're looking for the roof to be the pinnacle of this building, the anchor, the beacon, and uh, it will be. And the issues of solar control are excellent points that will be very much uh, at the heart of how we uh, technically execute that, and whether it's uh, transparent uh, glass or translucent glass, uh, as uh, Dawn had said, how much uh, roof overhangs we execute. So this is something that you should expect uh, refinements in as we come back. Back. Yeah, because I think this, I mean, that's what we talked about, is making this the... Right. Can you spell that? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I uh, think it's T-S-K. <laughs> um, the, the really monumental type, you know, hello, here's the library. Uh, and anyway, that's the hat has to go. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're glad to see the tower back, but it needs a different chapeau. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. Questions no. or comments? Okay. No, and, and I would agree. I, when, uh, I also missed it when I was reading through the, or looking at the pictures of what, what you'd sent home. And I agree, I don't like the top of, of this. <clears throat> and I'm not sure I like all the little squares of glass either. I tend to be more interested in a cleaner look, but. Okay. Is that all you have? No questions? Uh, and nothing else, <coughs> excuse me, at the moment. At the moment, okay. okay. Gary? Few. We'll, s we'll start, since David's up here, why not? <laughs> um, the, the Broadway 
entrance, the Broadway facing, it's so inviting. It, 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 to me, it's almost nicer than uh, and more appealing than the parking lot entrance. And I'm a little concerned because we don't intend, I hope, to have any drop-off area at all for anybody on Broadway. And I'm not trying to discourage the, the nice aesthetics, but when I, when that really jumps out at me as a place that I want to stop, get out, and go into the library. So I don't know how you deal with that, or if you can deal with it. Make it ugly. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not <laughs> suggesting that, but uh, do we have to put more trees? I, I don't know what to do. Well, we'll go back and uh, study that further. I think it's an excellent comment. Uh, I'm very pleased to hear how much you like the Broadway entry because at the moment my favorite still is the entry on the east side from the parking lot. So I will look at both entries with uh, fresh eyes uh, and see what we can do to make sure okay. both of I'm them I'm are I'm not suggesting that the handsome. parking lot's not attractive. <laughs> okay. I just like this sure. better. But could I clarify with that, with this uh, picture, David, is with the way the trees are placed, is that really the way the trees are placed? I know there will be an entire row of trees along there. So will it be as open as this? Um, I think at the on the Broadway elevation, uh, in the vicinity of the uh, library entry there, I believe we have predominantly new trees there. So there will be a certain openness appropriate to the entry there. Uh, we do want to make sure that uh, people are not confused in stopping uh, there, and the way we've designed the sidewalk in that area is to be very clear that there, uh, it's to communicate there is an entry uh, there and a civic presence on where uh, uh, should they go. But there, there actually is an existing tree that's been taken out so that you can see the entrance to the library. Mm -hmm. So it will be more screen than what the elevation shows. Okay. Well, you could also probably look at some uh, other kinds of bowlers or landscaping solutions along there if, if it turns out that that is a real. Sure, that's an excellent suggestion. Uh, Mr. Scrum? Um, this is kind of a comment, maybe a question. Looking at the underground parking, it's labeled as 140 spaces. I believe there's 130 spaces underground and that's what your estimate shows, um, 130 spaces underground. But I, uh, 40 above, 170. Okay. But Yes, and Dawn was just saying, and for those listening in, it is 130 below, uh, 40 above for a total of 170. Thank you. Um, the going to the schedule. This is maybe a clarification more than a question. Um, John had mentioned that the demolition would start after the holidays. You don't need to stand up. Okay. I, I, I hope that means the demolition will start after the ice rink during the holiday season. That is, that is correct. That's what that you is, meant, right? Yeah. Exactly. That's, that's Good. exactly what we discussed in our meeting. Good. Okay. And I, I have, I guess, um, some, there, there are more comments um, related to the budget, but perhaps we can wait till after the public. Sure. Okay. And I think mm -hmm. I had uh, my questions answered. I too saw the tower missing and had been there at the library advisor team meeting and I went, where did it go? I thought, oh no, another one of those cost cut things, you know. Mm -hmm. But apparently it is there and you're still working on the uh, details. Uh, and so I will hold my my uh, other, well, one, one other question I just wanted to clarify uh, in the budget. Um, Mr. Parnas, if you could clarify the funding for the books and the, um, the computers, if you could, well, that has been technology, planned for quite yes. some time. The, uh, the technology, that they aren't reflected in this budget. The, the, uh, when we, shortly after the, uh, the local election, when we were looking at alternatives and, and reducing costs, we, we found uh, other alternatives to pay for those two items, um, and, and they come from two sources. The uh, 250000 for the expansion of the book collection and the technology uh, cost of the library. I think it's about 1.2 million, 1.3, something like that. It, uh, those two will come from two sources. One is during the construction period of two years, both the county and the city have agreed that we'll continue to contribute the amount that we contribute currently towards the operation of the library. And uh, the operation will be much less expensive during construction, a very much smaller facility. Uh, that excess 
funding uh, can be reserved and used for acquisition of the collection and the books. Uh, in addition, we have been reserving money that we've collected from Measure Q for the last few years in anticipation of the development of the library. Measure Q language specifically provides for technology and equipment and library materials, and so that money has been reserved and can be used as well, in addition to allowing enough funds to operate the library for an extra year uh, so that we can go back to the voters uh, in 2010 and even 2011 and still be able to provide uh, for the equipping of the library with technology. So those, those items are budgeted, they are covered. They simply aren't within the scope of the architect's budget. Okay, thank you. And I do see that it is noted in the executive sum summary on page 1.1.1-8, uh, um, talking about the library opening day collection budget, uh, $250,000, then a technology budget of $1,232,000, uh, excuse me, $1,232,000 <laughs> um, are not currently in this uh, budget but it is budgeted for. So thank you for clarifying that. And thank you to the county library for working in partnership with the city uh, on that aspect. Thank you. All right, so now we will uh, open it up to the public for comment and if we put your name and address and you will have three minutes to comment on uh, what we have seen this evening. Conceptual design. Would anyone like to start? If anyone else is going to speak, I'd appreciate it if you come over to the side so that we won't have to uh, delay for people to walk all around the whole room. Anyone else care to speak, please come over to the side. Hello, friends and neighbors. I'm Julia Maxwell. I own the house behind the library. First, I want to thank the mayor and the city council for allowing me to keep my family house and to continue our family tradition into its 74th year this year. I really appreciate that you are leaving me alone. However, I still have concerns about the construction, about access to my property, about noise and dust pollution, about asbestos removal with the destruction of the current library, and about privacy at the end and during the construction. I have a meeting with the city engineer on the 16th. Hopefully a lot of these problems will be resolved. I'm anxious to find out exactly how wide my access will be in the course of the construction, what my utility access will be, gas, electric, cable. But these things I'm sure can be resolved. Again, thank you for letting me stay on in my family house with my family. Thank you. Next speaker. Uh, my name's Elizabeth Height, and I, that was my mother. Uh, and like my mother, I am very grateful uh, for the city's decision um, to allow us to keep our property. Uh, I also really appreciate how hard your job is. Um, I have no desire to sit where you are. <laughs> uh, and I, I know that you uh, give a lot of service to our community. Uh, I do have to speak up for the two uh, very significant trees that are being proposed to be removed. Uh, the valley oak and what was labeled as a Doug fir, but what is actually a deodar. And my mother's probably the only person on the planet who remembers that it was Mrs. Walker's deodar and it was her Christmas tree when her house was in the parking lot on Live Oak Way. Uh, it is not inconceivable for you to sacrifice parking spaces for these two heritage trees. Uh, indeed, you have required such preservation from the developer that created the Tiffany site. Because of your commitment to saving that oak, a beautiful refuge has been created that is so desirable that adjacent proposed developments are required to orient with, within that urban oasis. You required and the developer met alternative parking arrangements. 
I want you all to seriously consider the hypocrisy of having one rule for the city and a higher standard for everyone else. Will we be grateful for 15 more parking spaces or will we be grateful for two magnificent trees that if tended will still be here for future generations and probably after we're all dead? Danville has spent over $100,000 to try to save their iconic tree and I don't think you'd have to spend a great deal of money to save these. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Good evening. Ron Rose, Mono Creek. Um, here we're here for the trees. <laughs> I would imagine a lot of people would agree with that. Actually, I think that's a mimosa in front, isn't it? It's kind of a shame to see that thing go, too. Anyway, uh, what I really wanted to speak to was um, when I look at this, you know, I mean, it looks like a nice modern building and all that, but I don't really see anything groundbreaking here. And it really concerns me in, you know, in this century with all the changes that are already occurred and continue to occur at even faster pace with the change in the way that information is shared and um, administered and distributed in this society, not to have a technology budget, not to have a plan, uh, is really <laughs> very, very short-sighted. Because I don't think, you know, in the, in the coming years, especially the next generation, I was gonna be uh, as enamored with uh, sitting around in a library, you know, going through stacks of books. I think that you're going to see more, it's more of an information sharing community center. Uh, it should be more interactive with the people and the participants who are using it. And there should be some vision given to that. And, you know, I just think not, not addressing that from the start is extremely short-sighted. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Good evening. My name's Hardy Miller. Um, I'm here to talk about the library, of course, and, and it's become a community burden, I believe. Uh, it's, it's been made overly difficult, and to replace and get a new downtown library shouldn't be so hard. We need a new library. We want a new library. Civic Park has been a good location for the library in the past, and it could be a good location for the library in the future. Um, using the current footprint of the, uh, libra er, the current library and a portion of the tennis courts, I think there's ample space to build a library that's adequate for our downtown needs. Let's leave the parking lot alone. I think the parking lot is very charming. It's one of the nicest parking lots of its size in Connor Costa County. The project could be much simpler, not as difficult, less costly if we left the parking lot as is and used the current footprint of the library. And it would cost a lot less. Antioch, you may have read in the Connor Costa Times, uh, like us, we're in line to receive money. Uh, if the state bond passed, it didn't pass. So what have they done? They've trimmed their plans and moved on. I suggest that we have also evaluate some alternatives. There are alternatives besides Civic Park. As suggested, I put those in a letter to, uh, to you last week. Quickly, Veterans Hall, central location. We already own the property. It's being uh, plan now how to use it in adjacent properties so this could be a good location. The Transit Center uh, at BART, uh, massive project, uh, half a million dollar cost, you know, very po uh, possibly uh, it could be included. Another location would be Andronico's uh, if they were subject to uh, being agreeable to move. So in summary what I'd like to suggest is we trim our plans, like Antioch did. Um, we, if we are going to be in Civic Park, uh, we not use the parking lot, but more importantly, let's look at alternatives, evaluate them, and uh, see if there is a better alternative. Then move on. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
Next speaker. Madam Mayor, fellow councilmen, I agree with a lot of what, what Hardy has just said, but I'm up here to spend more money. I think if we have the hookups, oh, I'm sorry, Jake Bronson. I think if we have the hookups for photovoltaic, why aren't we considering using it in the initial cost? I know it's expensive, but maybe we could look at it. This library will probably have a 50 year span as the last two libraries have had. You expense it out, you know, find out how long it will take to pay it back and maybe our private foundations or public money can be used and we can gather the money to pay for it. But I think we need to look at it. I think we need to think a little bit green, money and environment, both green. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next speaker. I'm Diane Longshore to and I'm a Walnut Creek resident, and I'm here representing the Walnut Creek Library Foundation. And I want to tell you how much we appreciate the challenge that's before you. Um, you are really trying to design a civic building that will be the pride of the community, and right there is very subjective. It's difficult to um, please all the people, and you can never please them all the time. But also then to be sensitive to the cost. This has been a real target of discussion during this process, and we know that you're really um, performing a juggling act. We're very pleased with the progress you've made so far, and look forward to continuing to work with you as you go through this whole process. So look forward to the next public hearing on this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Hicks and members of the City Council. I'm Ann Kane. I'm a county librarian. I wanted to quickly address a couple of things. Just to clarify the issue of the technology, um, I think the point was that the 1.2 or 1.3 million is funded from another source, not that technology has not been looked at, as, as I know that you know, but there's a very, very detailed technology plan in the building program. You all have copies of it. I'd be more than happy to make it available to any of the members of the public that haven't had a chance to look at it. It will have, it will change between now and then because the technology is changing constantly. Um, it will have wireless um, access. It will also have all of the um, efficiency types of technology like self-check-in and self-check-out machines. Over 90% of the circulation of the, at this library should come from the self-check machine. So again, there is a very detailed um, technology plan. I also just wanted to mention that I'm not aware that Antioch has trimmed their plans. I'm, I'm not aware that they're actually planning to go forward with the library, so I congratulate you on finding ways to do that, and I thank you very much for, for doing that. Thank you. Could I ask you one question while you're there? Um, you mentioned we have a technology plan, but this entire library is designed so that as technology changes, is that not correct? It could be in any, perhaps any part of the building. It's not confined to the room that says it's going to have computers. So it's no technology will be throughout the throughout the entire building. And um, one of the things that one of the architects mentioned was the raised flooring. That is partly for your HVAC system and all, but it's also for your for your electronics and for your infrastructure as well. So if we go to iPods within a couple, three years, for everything, it will be able to take We'll be able out. to handle it. Okay. Thank you. So in other words, throughout the library, there's both wired and wireless access. In addition to the, uh, there will be computers throughout the library. In yes. In addition, there will be a computer lab as well as a separate area for uh, young adults. Right, and also for homework assistance as well. Right. Is that the number something like 92? Yeah, I, I don't have that off the top of my head. Um, but that sounds about right. In that, I was going to say 80 to 90. Yeah. And then, in addition to that, the library is licensed to uh, for software that isn't even available in some other uh, to others. Right. We um, pay licenses for all of the subscription databases that we have that have the full text of magazine articles and newspaper articles, as well as some of the major reference sources that. Um, really are too expensive for a community library to buy. We now have licenses for them. And so in addition to that, you have other licenses or other software programs. So perhaps someone that has a small business or a family that can't afford or doesn't choose to buy software can come in and use it in the library. Yes, we have a, actually on our website, we have something called the Business Connection, which has a lot of resources and a calendar of events for, it's specifically for small businesses. And I understand you've also been going out into the schools uh, in Walnut Creek and te in the high schools and teaching students, uh, teachers, how to teach students how to use 
the uh, technology and available through the library. We have. In fact, part of that came about as a result of your library commissioner, Deborah Burston, who's here tonight. And um, we, uh, the, the commission has talked about it, and we actually got a grant for about $25,000 for the state library. And we're going out, our staff are going out and, and helping the teachers um, learn about those databases. And one of the other things we've been able to do is because, because of the licensing agreement, you have to have a library card in order to access the databases. And when we go out into the school, some of the teachers and the kids don't have um, library cards, and it's hard to... Um, it, it's hard for them. It's hard to explain to them and, and introduce them to a service, and then they can't use it. So we now have anybody can go onto our computer and get an electronic card right away that you can use right that very minute to access our databases. And after school, there will be uh, homework centers in the technology lab, or yes, yes. There will be both. Um, there'll be things like tutoring, one-on-one -on -one tutoring. There's also small group study rooms in in your library, um, and we've got some um, plans with um, some career centers and that kind of thing for uh, various various age groups of, of students, and also adult uh, technology labs so that people can use more of your yes uh, applications. Well, I'm sure there's even more, but that's just <laughs> a little bit of what the uh, technology will do. There. Could I just ask one more question? Through your library, you can contact any library in the world. Is that more or less correct, or at least any, mm -hmm. any in the U.S.? Yeah, yes. I mean, we can find resources wherever they exist throughout the world. I mean, if you want a book that's not in the 1.3 million that we have, or even if it's not in the Bay Area, although the Bay Area is very rich in resources to get books on interlibrary loan, but we can get a book from anywhere. And then lastly, as I understand it, it will also be uh, uh, wired, so, or not wired, there will be wireless outside, so you can enjoy the park or the patio area. Yeah, again, the architects can address how, how far away from the buildings, but actually some, we have some people sitting outside of our libraries now with laptops on the nice days that are um, using, the, using the wireless access. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next speaker. Good evening, Mayor Hicks and members of the council, um, city manager. I am Bob Britton. I live in Walnut Creek. I'm a president of the Friends of the Library. I wanted to come up tonight and express my appreciation for the extremely hard work that's been done by the city staff, by the council, and by our architects and cost estimators in managing to keep this cost, this um, library project uh, on budget. And I know that requires some sacrifices. I personally would like to have photovoltaics on the, on the roof or out over the, the garage immediately. Uh, I think it would be great if we could have a separate fundraising effort for that. However, I think we need to keep our eyes on the ball here. There is a library plan. There are needs that have been evaluated. Uh, included in that, we've got great energy efficiency in, enveloped into this library plan. Daylight harvesting is a very ex inexpensive way to save energy. Uh, we have excellent roof design that's going to prevent uh, solar attack on the inside of the library. Uh, really, it's, it's a, a very cost-effective design, and I'm, I'm proud of that. I'm a scientist. I've, I worked on solar energy myself in the past, so I certainly appreciate the opportunity for the future. I also work in the Open Space Foundation. I hate it that we're going to lose a couple of important trees here. But I, I think that part of this entire program could be to encourage people to go out to our open space and, and plant some more oak trees. That's a wonderful opportunity. There's plenty of land out there that's waiting for new trees. So I want to, again, say thank you very much for keeping this project moving. And I look forward to working with you as hard as possible in the future. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. Next. Good evening, Madam Mayor, City Council, staff, and public. My name is Barry Slavin, and I live at 1956 Rim Ridge Court, and I've lived there for the last 20 years. I've lived in the area since 1972. Uh, I just wanted to make a couple of comments regarding the library um, that maybe you're going to make later, I'm hoping. Number one, um, the footprint of the library has, has now been um, ascertained after 10 years of discussion, we have more park area now available for those people that were worried about Civic Park all this time. 
it allows us for the possibility of ice rinks and things like that for the future but i think the interesting thing is if you think back over the last ten years to the design of the cities like dublin and pleasant hill where they kept referring back to the model city being on the creek i think we're restoring our position once again as a city that everybody else is going to want to follow and if any i cast a cut back anything it's only because they can't copy i think one of the things that we also need to congratulate our architects on is each time we've seen a design it has been better and better and better and i'm surprised that we didn't hear some applause for the presentation tonight because I think it's rather interesting that we're now able to go from the outside to the inside of the library and finally see what our library and what 43.5 is going to buy. Um, lastly, I think that um, the most important thing, in addition to having a nice cafe that I think is going to be a terrific addition to our park, I think the most important thing, and I'm sure it's high on your mind, is A, keep it under cost control. B, I think as we've looked at these designs, I don't think there's a whole lot of frills that are being shown here. There certainly isn't anything that looks that earth shattering that we're spending a whole lot of money on. And C, I would hope that we can build a library that follows the lead matrix without spending a lot of excess money to satisfy something that doesn't bring us a just reward. So I hope that we can finally bring out the shovels, take your pictures, and get this library built. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the council. My name is Jay Hoyer. I'm president of the Walnut Creek Chamber of Commerce. Um, on, on behalf of uh, a lot of folks out in the community and the, and the business community, I've got to agree with a lot of the speakers. This has been quite a job. Uh, this is a pretty complicated project, and I've got to commend you on listening very well. We've all had something to say, and it seems like you've responded to a great deal of it. And a big part of that is the concept that a, a library is not a box of books. It's a, it's a whole lot of things. Um, I'd like to speak to one of those right now. It's a multi-use facility inside and out. And, and I know the ice rink came up earlier, but that's an example of something that can be done. Each year we have uh, um, all the flags on display. What, a, what an interesting opportunity to display some flags around, around this facility. We have uh, the 4th of July, we have the uh, Veterans Day, we have a variety of activities. What an interesting place to do that. I'm looking at a big park with a big open space. I really hope we're taking a careful look at being able to use that for activities like that so that larger groups, I know we've got a beautiful spot over here, but it's kind of small, um, to have, have patriotic demonstrations. It would be nice for us to be able to do that. That's the multi-use concept where I hope we're looking at power for things like ice rinks, power for things like being able to have evening activities, sound systems, etc., so that the outside use can be as active and versatile as what appears to be the inside, which is, to me, remarkable. There's an awful lot going in there from, from this sort of ease of use. You come in and have a cup of coffee and go in and get a book and experience, or have the kids come into an activity. Or it's sort of a blend of a lot going on, and I see that blend internally and externally. And I've got to tell you, you've done a whole lot better job than I could have. That's, that's very remarkable that you've been able to accommodate so many different interests. So uh, on behalf of the Chamber of Commerce, really appreciate those efforts. Please let us know if we can help. Thanks. Thank you very much. Good evening, council members. I'm Cindy Silva. First, I'd like to say thank you very much for giving the whole community an opportunity tonight to see this plan as it's evolving. And thank you to the architects for um, just sticking with us for so long to find the right solution. I have to tell you that this is the reason why so many of us love living in Walnut Creek. We are a community that can have a vision, we can identify our needs, we can identify the challenges, and we're going to find a way to do it. And hallelujah, I can't tell you the hundreds of people that ask me all the time, we can do this, we know we can, let's get it done. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Any other speakers? Okay, seeing none, I will bring it back to the council, to everyone. And, uh, you know, before we proceed, I do want to comment and thank, we have a troop of Boy Scouts here this evening uh, watching their, uh, their local government at work. And uh, you've been here with us quite a while now, and I really appreciate <laughs> you being here. What, what troop are you in? Uh, we're in the 302. 302. 
302. 302. Troop 302, and where are you based? Uh, we are based in Grace Presbyterian Church on Tice Valley. Tice Valley, very good. Well, thank you for being here this evening, and we certainly appreciate it as you learn to become uh, more educated citizens. Thank you. You must be working on your citizenship badge, perhaps? Yes? <laughs> A lot of us have been involved with Boy Scouts over time. Thank you very much. All right, back to the council on this matter. And uh, do we have further questions, first of all, or answering questions that were asked during the public comment? And um, let's see. We answered pretty much of the question, I think, regarding the technology mm -hmm. uh, pretty thoroughly. And uh, unless the unless staff has something to add, um, and uh, Mr. Galia, yes. I know uh, there's been comment regarding looking at options, other alternatives, locations, and so on. Uh, when you know we've been planning this for quite some quite a yes. number of years since the uh, this particular uh, building since the mid '90s, and you served on a site selection committee. Could you? talk about that and tell us what was done at that time. Yes, I, I would be very happy to. Uh, it's about a decade ago, I'm sort of losing track of time, <clears throat> that we hired Gloria Stockton, who is a, uh, an expert uh, library consultant. Uh, actually, the county and the city went together in hiring her to come out and help us evaluate the needs of a library service here in Walnut Creek. So that was the beginning, and uh, we had a committee that, that uh, was put together <clears throat> that included people who use the library, people who didn't use the library, uh, people from various commissions, friends of the library. We also had on it our then county librarian, Anne Marie Gold, uh, the second in command, Anne Kane, who is now in command, and uh, the third uh, librarian involved was Anne Shelton, the head librarian. And I remember asking if it was criteria in this area you had to be named Anne in order to be a librarian. <laughs> Nevertheless, we got started on our, on our work and uh, we also had Nolan Tam who was, uh, that Gloria Stockton had brought in as part of her team to evaluate our building, evaluate the site, take a look at all of the things that, would, that we would have to consider if we were going to make any change in the library. And the first thing we ask is, can we add on to the library? Well, it turned out it's a concrete tilt-up building, and that kind of building is very difficult to add on to. Once you've got a hole in it, then it's very expensive to try to keep everything in place so it doesn't all fall down around you. And it was determined that we would be better off with a different building. At the same time, we began to look at other sites around Walnut Creek. <clears throat> Were there other places that we might consider rather than this particular place? Uh, one of the buildings we looked at is where Washington Mutual is now located. They had just purchased both Home Savings, which is the building there at Maine and Newell, and American Savings, which is downtown where Talbot's now is. They were at that time debating which of the two buildings they were going to keep as their headquarters. And so we were interested in the one at Newell and Maine, and a small committee went to evaluate whether that might be a site. There is parking there, and there is a building, I believe it's three stories. So in looking through it, the determination was made that it'd be a very inefficient library. There would be a lot of work that would have to be done, including making it ADA accessible, since it was built prior to having to put in all of the accessibility things. So just redoing a good portion of the building for that would be expensive. Secondly, the layout of the building, though wonderful for a bank, was not very good for a library. And it also meant that they would have to have far more staff members if indeed that was converted in some fashion because of the way it is laid out. Uh, we finally came to the conclusion that the purchase price plus all of the remodeling that would be necessary would be very expensive and we'd end up with a third-rate library. It simply wouldn't meet the needs that libraries are supposed to meet. We also looked at the building that's catacorner over here and that one's laid out even, uh, well, it's, it's very different. And um, <laughs> We even looked at it as an addition to City Hall. Uh, we looked at it twice and came to the conclusion that the way it is built, it would be a very difficult building to try to use for a library. We talked to the Walnut Creek School District. They do have property um, that 
might be used at the corner of Walnut Boulevard and Ignacio Valley Road. Their old corporation yard is still there, and they, then their sites begin with uh, Walnut Creek Intermediate. So we talked to the school district at length about going together on a library. And there were some good things and some bad things. Putting them on school campuses does make it more difficult for schools, particularly for who's there and who's wandering around on the school part of the campus. Secondly, the parking would have been exceedingly tight. Thirdly, it is one of the busiest corners in Walnut Creek. And um, with considering all of these factors, we decided that that probably was not the best place to put it. We also looked at BART. That BART parking lot has been talked about for 25 years. <coughs> Some people wanted to put the regional center there. <coughs> and again, in looking at who's going to use the library, how are they going to get there, uh, that also did not seem to be the best place. Plus, remember, there'd be the cost of purchasing or at least probably long-term leasing. Is that what they're doing now, 100-year leases or whatever, <coughs> to BART to use it? And again, it's at one of the busiest intersections. We also looked to see if there was anything else. There are some office buildings, again, on Civic Drive. We took a look at one of those that had been offered as, as potentially for sale. And the problem, again, is they've been built for a different use. And looking at it once more, we're talking about much higher costs than if we start from scratch on property that we own. It's been suggested that the Veterans Hall building that site might be used. Again, you're talking very expensive underground parking if you were going to use it. And in the middle of a retail district, I'm not sure that's the best use either. So we kept coming back to this site. And I would um, remind you that the property where the library now sits was purchased from Mrs. Maxwell's grandmother, fair market value, and then some. Uh, and with a purchase for, yes, I've seen the documents, uh, <laughs> um, ex uh, ex expressly for a library. And the parking lot had been a series of small homes. Ms. Height mentioned that, that one tree had belonged to Mrs. I, don't, I didn't catch her the name. Walker. Walker, thank you. Uh, that property was also purchased by the city expressly to be a parking lot for the library. And the only home that was not purchased is Miss Maxwell's. So at any rate, it's been there for a long time. That property was never, ever part of the park, which, by the way, if you don't know, previously to being a park was the uh, sewer treatment plant. And I guess when they joined uh, the, the uh, Central Sanitary District, it was no longer needed, <clears throat> and it was turned into a park. So I would let you know a lot of research went into where we were going to go, where we would place it. The architects have been very sensitive to the fact that they, we do not want them to intrude into the park very much. We said they could take the tennis courts. Now I find they're not taking the entire tennis courts. So that's correct. So they are trying to make more green space available in the park with this design. And they're also trying to extend the park to the corner. So it's not just parking lot, then library, then park, that there is a continuum. And I think they have tried and done very well in, in bringing the park, in effect, through what was to be and always has been, or I shouldn't say always, but since it was built, has been the library and parking lot. The other comment that has been made at different times is we need consensus. And since I've heard it so frequently, I checked three different dictionaries to find out what is the definition of consensus. And each one listed as the first word, majority. And we have certainly had more than a majority of support, both for the local bond and the people in this community supported the state bond by more than a majority. So I believe we've met that criteria as well, even though statewide, everybody did not get to the majority. And at the local election, we did not hit the super majority that is required. So is that enough background? Is everybody bored to tears? <laughs> Thank you for answering the question. <laughs> what was the question? <laughs> Don't what went before? It. Yes. <laughs> Considerable due diligence was used to uh, investigate optional sites, and you finally decided that the site purchase for the library originally was the best. Was site. the best to serve this community. It is served by buses. People can walk from town. It is right by the park. There is parking, etc. Interconnecting trail systems and so on. Yes, exactly. All right. Uh,
Thank you. And um, uh, we do, I believe, in terms of the questions regarding the um, the LEED and the uh, the green type of building, uh, environmentally uh, efficient, energy efficient building. Uh, maybe uh, if you could, Don, come to the microphone and ag again detail a little bit in terms of we are following the guidelines of the um, LEED. Right. And we mm -hmm. actually have enough points, and it goes by the point system according to what kind of technology you add to qualify, as I understand it. Could you go into that a little bit more? And what, what do we have to do in order to actually get the rating, and what kind of cost is involved in that? Um, currently, uh, based on the design goals and the strategies identified for the building systems, we have 26 points with the LEED matrix, which would qualify for LEED certification, which is 26 to 32 points. Um, in addition to the 26 points, which were definite yeses in the current project budget and within the current systems being um, discussed as um, good choices for this building, um, there was also an additional, I believe, 23 maybes. And so if LEED was a criteria that was wished to be pursued, it would be very easy for this project within its current construction budget to be LEED certified. What is not included in the current budget is the documentation cost that goes along with the LEED certification, which is not insignificant. Um, I, we have looked into that and the soft cost, which is well below what is given as a general guideline for soft cost, which is like one to two percent of the design fees right now, is probably 150 to $200,000. The $200,000 would include um, supplemental commissioning, which is an additional lead point, which helps you become more in the certification range. The $150,000 fees um, would not include that. And so it's, it's not insignificant in cost to become LEED certified. Um, the construction cost as the budget is currently set, um, discussions with Swinnerton, John Baker, and Davis Langdon, um, the current construction budget is adequate to meet LEED certification. Okay. Um, and so in other words, that is sort of a, a paper type award one gets to say I am certified, but yes. you can do everything in terms of the uh, technology. Meet the criteria, meet the criteria to meet the LEED certification, yes. Which is the designs of the mechanical system being energy efficient, the daylighting, kind of that whole list that I went through, the energy, the, um, the light colored roof which gives you no heat gain, using light colored concrete on the parking lot so you don't create heat islands, treating your storm water. It's a very integrated approach in which we apply to all of our projects, not just LEED certification and that's why we've already integrated into the early conceptual design work and we'll continue doing so throughout the project. It's the actual documentation to get that certification from LEED which is not included in the work. Okay. And, uh, and the Volta photovoltaics, the PV. Right. Photovoltaics. Right. Roof. And uh, what is the additional cost to? We're setting it up so that it is ready for that. It is PVs ready. Mm -hmm. um, the additional cost for the photovoltaics. Um, let me just. I, we went over. I, I was spent a lot more time at the last council meeting under the photovoltaics, so I didn't go there tonight. So I apologize um, for the person who had the question. It. The life cycle cost for the photovoltaics right now has a payback beyond 20 years. And that typically takes it out of kind of your optimum range, which is 10 to 15 years for a public building, that you would say, yeah, this is worth life cycle cost. The building will last 40 to 50 years. It would be a good investment. But beyond 20 years kind of takes it out of that range. And so that's why the photovoltaic ready um, with the infrastructure in the building to be ready for a future installation of PVs on the roof was decided upon. Now that PV installation could be on the roof of this building, which it actually has a pretty small footprint and, and 20, you know, 4,000 square feet I think is our, no actually I think it's 23,000 square feet as our roof is 
not a big area for photovoltaic. So even perhaps shading the surface parking lot is an option there. Um, but the payback really isn't there right now for it to be recommended with the life cycle cost analysis. But the thought is the price for photovoltaics is continuing to come down. It's consistently lower than it was five years ago. And in five years, there may be more rebates, more programs available to help fund it. And uh, are we uh, keeping open the consideration of applying to PG&E for Absolutely. PG&E, we are um, looking at a rebate for savings by design for PG&E, which is a program PG&E runs, and it's currently in our work plan and our schedule to do that. Um, however, it's the budget that is established at the beginning of every year. And so we can't guarantee that that rebate will be available to the building by savings by design, but our goal is certainly to apply for it if it is available and receive it. Well, I'm very pleased that we've reached the uh, qualification level for the, uh, the LEED rating, and it sounds like we might even be able to do more as Absolutely. time moves forward. Yeah. Uh, other questions here? Oh, yeah, again, to, to clarify, we may exceed the 32 points, and it may sound like we can achieve this LEED certificate, but until we go through the expense of actually assembling the documentation, we would not be eligible to get the certificate. Although the design would be very sustainable, and we'd be very proud of that. Yes. I want to right. make sure. Okay. Right. And lead equivalence is something that is being used. There's been other cities. City of San Jose for a few years was pursuing an in-house um, green program, and they were trying to develop it in-house. And one of our libraries down there is a silver equivalent, um, but is not lead silver certification. Okay. So. Okay. Uh, other questions? Yes. Just one, and I know that we talked about it in, in the committee, but it is one that uh, you do not need to respond to tonight, but that you, I would hope, would keep in mind. When I look at the schedule, it just seems forever. And um, I would hope that, um, not that we want you cutting corners and all of that kind of good things, but into the ice rink. <laughs> yeah, okay. Holding off right now. <laughs> um, but if there's anything that can speed that schedule up, I mean, it just seems unconscionable that we are planning now and wouldn't be able to move in until 2010. But so you, you are working on that, you said. Well, one, one, one thing I will comment on is during the schematic design process, in fact, we've already begun doing this. Yes. We're, along with the architects and engineers, we've been, we've been doing some strategizing about what potentials there are for uh, in terms of how the structure is designed and things of that nature that may be able to expedite construction, the construction schedule. But again, these are still options we're looking at during schematic design and we have not gone through the detailed analysis we need to do, do that. But it, it is a goal of ours to look at, make sure we look at all options that we can to try and expedite the schedule. I, I would hope so. I would just encourage that, please. If, if I could add, mm -hmm. um, recognizing the spring the planned spring start in 2008, that's, I am guessing John would agree that that's probably the optimum time to start construction. You're re when, when the first thing we're going to be doing is digging a hole in the ground, you really don't want to start that in October or November. And, uh, you know, Murphy's Law, then you're going to get to the deepest point, and guess what? Then you're going to get rain for a month. So the, you're kind of into that position now where do you really want to... Don't start spring 2007. <laughs> yeah, come on. No, I just uh, yeah, when I look at that schedule, if you if there's anything, and I and I realize you're working on it, and and I, I know your and Jared, that your expertise. Gary's too. a water engineer, so we have yes. to respect his, his knowledge about water. <laughs> uh, okay. I don't have to respect uh, any of my knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and did you have more? No, Raymond. Okay. I, I don't have questions if, if we're ready for comments. Okay. Are, 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 are you have questions? questions? No, I don't have any. Yeah. Go ahead. I, I, I'll start off by wanting to thank and applaud and whatever positive things I can say to the entire design team, Group 4, Swinerton, um, the LAT, and staff. This is really coming together well. As Barry Slavin put it, the design is getting better and better. I want to thank you all. It's, it's really very impressive. Um, that being said, I do have a couple comments. Uh, I was had, glad to hear that Diane mentioned that the, the whole team is, is sensitive to the cost. And, and, and Bob Britton, you mentioned that you're going to keep your eye on the ball, and we're all going to keep our eye on the ball. 
and, and that's kind of the, the theme of my comments, um, that we have to continue to do that. Uh, I'll, I'll comment on escalation, and, and for some background information, folks, I am a construction management professional, so although I, I'm certainly not a, an expert in libraries, I, I do have a little knowledge of construction. Um, in regards to the escalation, it's so difficult to predict now. Um, I just put together a white paper for an, another client and did an interview of a number with a number of contractors and the contracting community, based on the volatility of the market, they're recommending 1% escalation per month. And, and, and you know, you could debate, is it half percent, is it 1%? So we've included 13%. That may or may not be enough. Again, this is not, a, not I don't want to get into a debate. It's just something that let's keep our eye on the ball. And I'm sure you're monitoring ENR costs on a monthly basis and we'll, we'll continue to update this. Um, second item, John, you touched on it, labor availability and the bidding climate. There is so much work out there in, in the construction community and that's what's making it very, exp that's part of the reason things are so expensive. You've got the material issues and then you've got labor availability and contractors are very selective. What probably hasn't been considered but will need to be considered probably starting in December of this year is there are five major bond measures uh, up for vote in the state of California that will infuse billions of dollars, which is good for John, it's good for my business, it's gonna be tough and tougher on the prices that, are, that we'll be looking forward to for the next two to four to five years when this bond m money becomes available. And then lastly are some, some comments on square foot costs. Um, I want to preface my comments that I know I'm not comparing necessarily apples to apples because uh, a, a library like this is a unique design. Um, but I do offer it for comparison purposes and again as caution. Now, I'll use an example, a project our firm is working on. It was, um, I, I went back and looked through our files at some of the cost estimates that was done by Davis Langdon and this is in no way a commentary on the capabilities of Davis Langdon. This is, a, this is comments and information offered that shows how cost, if you don't keep your eye on the ball, can get out of control. Um, our, to put it a baseline, the current plan construction cost as being recommended by Davis Langdon is $314 a square foot. Keep that as your, as your baseline. The Orinda City Hall, just down the street, the schematic design plan construction cost was $275 per square foot. A few months later, the design at 30% was up to $312 per square foot. I won't go through all the pages. At bid time, the estimate was $450 per square foot. And when the project was bid last August, the bid prices were $507 a square foot. It's just something to keep in mind. We're currently at the schematic design estimate at 314 concept at $314 a square foot. Um, we just opened bids on a project where construction management, providing construction management services for the city of Danville, their community center. The bids were $600 a square foot. And this is a community center that's basically one big building, a kitchen, and a couple little ancillary rooms. And not a very fancy building. Again, the comment is to show that the cost of construction is getting higher and higher. And then as the last example, we're at $314 a square foot, just down the street. Lafayette's current estimate of construction cost is just over $500 a square foot. So that's not, I'm not trying to put doom or gloom, I'll just remember, I, I, Mr. Britton, you put it best, as we have to continue to keep our eye on the ball, and I'm confident we will. That's it. Okay, other comments? Well, maybe I have one to deal with that. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll have to tell you what this is all about. So, Ms. Longshore, you're representing the foundation, right? Okay, well, why don't you come up? And I'll tell you what this represents. Um, I always pick up pennies off the street. You always find them around. So I must have had 30 or 40. And then we were up at our vacation home uh, a month ago, and people there uh, take their spare change and put it in this little container. 
so that whoever has to go get the papers in the morning, you know, always has change. And so I was looking the other day, and it was full of pennies. So I sat a granddaughter down and said, I want you to take all the pennies out, which she did, and uh, put them in a bag. And then when we came home, I realized my husband did the same thing. So I had a different grandchild to go through and take out all the pennies. And then we counted them. There's $7 of pennies here. Thank and you so I, much. <laughs> I recognize it's not going to take care of the escalated costs uh, per square foot, but, but take a look at how many pennies. It's heavy, too. Uh, if, if everybody in Walnut Every Creek... Every penny helps. Yeah, look at, look at the number of pennies that haven't been in circulation for years. And uh, secondly, look at how much money we could contribute toward the library. So I would like to suggest that we all go and do this and turn the pennies over to the library. And uh, maybe we can get it up to 315 a square foot <laughs> or 320 or something and uh, help provide uh, for some of the extras in the library. Well, thank you very much. On behalf of the Foundation Councilmember Regalia, and I would second your thought. I think this is a good way to put pennies that we are actually leaving on the ground when we see them because we don't think they have any use. Well, they certainly do, and you're proving it. Thank you. Well, we'll take even other coins, but I yeah. just... <laughs> Silver dollars, yeah, you know, anything, those, right? Things that are green and folding. <laughs> okay, did you, did you have any other comment? Uh, <laughs> no, I, well, I want to show. My grandson took out the Canadian penny. He said it didn't belong. So, no, I, I'm very pleased with the direction that this is going. Uh, I'm very happy. Certainly, at every meeting, our architectural firm has listened to everybody who's had comments. You really have and done your best, even, you know, we may have different feelings and views, but often our views are not that far apart, and you've really done your best to incorporate them, and I, and I agree each time I've seen this, I think it's a better plan, and I expect it to be an excellent building. And I'd also point out that we actually did reduce the size by putting some of the things inside the building, yes. the cafe and mm -hmm. friends bookstore, et cetera, so we, we have reduced the size. Where the parking. Okay, and thank you. Further I think it's been well covered, uh, and as I say, I appreciate your um, work. As I, when we started out, I had one of the biggest problems with the roof, and it's, uh, it's coming together. Just take the hat off the beacon. That's all. <laughs> okay. Thank you, and I agree. It's uh, been a great team effort. You've done a great job of listening to the city and to uh, the council and to the community in your design development. And um, I do appreciate your effort in, in terms of being a sustainable uh, plan. Um, uh, we are pleased about the light tower. I think as you evolve it, it will become a very special, probably uh, kind of an art statement um, and a, a focal point in the library. I appreciate that you've worked very hard along with staff uh, and Rachel and the engineering team uh, to keep the costs uh, in hand, and you're continually checking that, and I appreciate it. And it really says very loudly to all of us that we should not delay, that we should keep moving forward. We've, um, we've settled on a plan now, a location. We should keep moving forward. And um, as the design evolves, we're, we're going to see, start seeing uh, how really lovely it's going to be. We're going to start seeing those kind of design details. Uh, getting into the future. And that will help us and our partners, the Library Foundation, Friends of the Library, and all of us working together to raise the, uh, the funds and help to close that gap. And uh, I don't know, I've been looking at my checkbook lately and I hope a lot of people are because uh, it's very important to start actually making those both large and small donations to the Library Foundation. So uh, this really is going to be uh, a very, very special place as well as a practical place in our community. Um, it will be a community center for learning, for life, for people of all ages. It will be interconnected with our community center and our senior center. We have our school partnerships ready to go with uh, after school homework help centers and all kinds of opportunities for our young people. 
and uh, special programs to the library, but also after hours, because it can be locked off, uh, the uh, one portion of the library can be open in the evening with our multi-purpose rooms, with the computer center, um, and uh, the Friends of the Library, the cafe, and uh, the browsing area. Now, people say, well, what is a browsing area anyway? Well, it's a, pr of a place where they have all kinds of uh, um, new media kinds of things like uh, uh, CDs and DVDs and uh, magazines and all kinds of things where you might want to uh, hang out and browse. Um, so instead of uh, maybe going down to Starbucks for the evening, or going down to uh, one of the bookstores downtown, um, you know, competition is good. And uh, we've, we've had local bookstores tell us that competition is good. So um, we, have, we will have a place, too, for our young people uh, in the evening and for, for uh, city programs and, uh, and other uh, community organizations to have meetings. So uh, this is uh, an investment in the community, just like the wonderful and irreplaceable Dean Lesher Regional Center for the Arts. I can't imagine Walnut Creek without that now, and yet that was an enormous investment. And the city was the, was the organization uh, on behalf of the citizens that made most of that investment. And it took some time, it took some savings, and yet we did it. Same thing with the open space. It is one of the most magnificent things that's ever happened to this city. It changed the face of Walnut Creek forever. And it is wonderful, defining our ridge lines and our, our city boundaries. And yes, our citizens invested in that and helped to pay for it. But the city later invested millions of dollars, uh, $10 million alone in the early 90s to add to the open space. Recently, we spent some money to add another parcel in partnership with uh, Save Mount Diablo and East Bay Regional Parks in the county. So this is library and community learning center is another very important investment in our community that is going to, to benefit our citizens for many, many years into the future. And I'm very proud of all the people that have worked to make this come become a reality and we've taken steps forward. It takes many steps forward sometimes to reach your goal and uh, we are we are climbing that mountain and we're getting there. So thanks for everyone's help and I will applaud the design and I hope you'll join me. Okay, okay and I think that's all you need. Thank you very much uh, team for coming here tonight. And then next on the agenda is item 4B, funding for the creek, a middle school youth center. Thank you, thank you very much. We're, we're continuing the meeting, so if folks could visit outside, it would really be helpful. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Hicks and members of the council. I'm Sandra Kendall, the administrative analyst in the community development department. I am here tonight on behalf of council members Regalia and Skrell, acting as the grant committee to request funding for the Creek, a middle school youth center. The Creek is a nonprofit organization located on the campus of Foothill Middle School. It provides an after school program for all use in the area in grades six through eight. Since opening in September of 2005, the program has been extremely successful and recognized for its contribution to the Walnut Creek community. Student enrollment has surpassed expectations, and because of this high demand, there is a need for an additional modular classroom. The new classroom will house a computer lab 
and homework area. The projected cost to bring another building to the site is $70,300. The Creek is requesting $10,000 to assist with these costs. An application from the Creek has been received and reviewed by Community Development Community Service Grant Committee. Funding to be to awarded from the Council's Community Outreach Program. Contributions from other funding sources have already been received, totaling $61,000. The founders of this program continue to receive private donations through fundraising, which will help furnish the computer lab and to support a future scholarship program targeted for the 0708 school year. Council is now being asked to appropriate the $10,000 from the community outreach program to help fund this additional modular classroom that is needed to house the growing student enrollment at the Creek. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there uh, first questions and any questions? Yeah, Ms. Not, not any questions, just a comment. Number one, I think it's, it's a great program. I'm very impressed. But number two, it's always nice when uh, requests like this comes forward and you can see that they've already gone out and getting other support uh, J.M. Long Foundation and individuals, and right. it's very hard. Representatives from the Creek are here in the audience, so if you have any questions, you can address. No, them just to praise. Them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, as I say, it's it's nice when you see that they've already made those kind of efforts and outreach yeah. involving the rest of the community, and not just uh, coming to the city for all of it. It makes it much easier to do that. Mm -hmm. I have praise as well, and maybe one question. Yeah. This has been such a success as you predicted it would be. Um, mm -hmm. This goes back a couple of years when we first started these discussions at Foothill. What has anybody approached you from? Uh, I'm guessing the Walnut Creek Intermediate School is an ideal location. I think they have room. Has they, have you had any dialogue with anybody from the campus, or are you? Um, considering moving into that direction to take on uh, project Glad number two? Come up to the mic, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because of my, as you're walking up, my recollection is you definitely wanted to have this prototype at Foothill, but your dreams go beyond just Foothill. Well, actually what our hope was that this is a filling a void that's everywhere. Middle school, after school care is not very common. And so we started the Creek in the hopes that it's a pilot program and with the idea that it would be very successful and that other people like at Walnut Creek Intermediate or other schools would come to us to say, how do you, how do you get this started? And we'd be, we would be happy to share information mm -hmm. and get that kind of program going. We've had other communities come and see the mm -hmm. Creek from outside the area. Maybe Brad Rovenpera or the Nutshell can do a little mm -hmm. story mm -hmm. to, to spark some interest. It'd be wonderful. We're more than happy to help somebody get it started. Okay. Our enrollment has, last year I think at this time we had 40 students and now we're up to 90 before um, school starts this year. So, wow. yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Well, well, well since I have I the money. Yes, I have a question, uh, mm -hmm. if you would. Um, and if you, I just think this is a fantastic program and I've actually been to visit your classes and uh, I was very impressed with all the different activities going on, especially kids doing after school homework. Yeah. <laughs> but I note you also have a volunteer or two that are in helping. Um, uh, I know there's a gentleman that is uh, actually a long time uh, resident of Walnut Creek mm -hmm. and uh, now a widower looking for something wonderful to do and he certainly has found it and I'm helping you. Uh, but I do have a question. Um, has the modular building been put up already? Yes. 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 I did receive uh, communication from one of the neighbors who mm -hmm. uh, all of a sudden, because there was no communication with the neighbors prior to the building being installed according to the phone call I had, mm -hmm. very upset about the building being kind of looming over their backyard now. And um, I'm wondering if there's a way to put some kind of screening, a plantings, uh, 
shrubbery. I know there's probably not a lot of room, but. Well, we actually met with um, the neighbor before the building went in, mm -hmm. and then we did go over there last week. Last week, and so um, Sandy Meyer came also from the city. Right, she was right, I had asked her to yeah. try mm -hmm. to help. And um, we, we have resolved. spoken with the neighbor. I think we've resolved it. We're going to put a, uh, what's it called? It's, it's a called climbing. It's fine. Yeah, a vine. fine. Oh, good. On our building. And um, she was absolutely fine with that. Great. I know she's very supportive of the school yeah. and, mm -hmm. um, in general. So that's great when you can work together as a yeah. team and mm -hmm. be good neighbors. I, I really appreciate that. Yeah. Thank sure. you. Well, it works both ways. It helps us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Could they identify themselves for the record? Oh, oh sure. yes, I'm sorry. Your names, please. We are the directors. I'm Donna Parham. And I'm Tricia Carella. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other questions? No, okay. I just we will applaud comment. what I mean, you're doing. We need to have public Thank comment, you. too. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Ms. Kendall's opening comments were that they're recognized by the community, but it, it goes beyond that. And maybe you can talk a little bit about your, didn't you have a lunch or something with the governor because of your activities? And didn't you have an interview with Katie Keurig? Well, not exactly. Uh, or, or maybe your husband's feeding the, uh, <laughs> he's in, is he embellishing yeah, a little bit? We did meet with the governor and that was um, very helpful in terms of helping us uh, get some contacts and getting the creek started mm -hmm. and uh, gave us a lot of community awareness. That was very helpful. And uh, the Katie Keurig thing, we were just part of a forum last week uh -huh. or two weeks ago on um, world news. Just part of a we were, we were invited panel. to be part of a forum. Yeah. Yeah. That's so pretty impressive. But it wasn't a one-on-one on one one meeting. <laughs> Come on, go with it. <laughs> but it was very interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was great fun. to meet her. Congratulations. Yeah. Yeah. Now we really do need to hear public comment. And so does anyone from the public care to comment on this, this issue? If so, please step forward. No? All right then. Thank you. I'll bring it back to council, and um, I think we uh, all agree. We give you the heartiest congratulations for a job well done with our middle school students at the after school. Thank you so much. And, and so, is there a motion? Mm -hmm. Sure. I move to approve ten thousand dollar grant from the community outreach fund for the Creek, a middle school youth center. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. All right, and uh, next on the agenda, uh, item 4C, housing program report 2005-2006. And we have Clint Lofton, our housing program manager, here with us. And I think for the first time in my years on the council, I'm in my 12th year, we actually had in our council packet a, uh, a CD. We're getting in high tech yeah, here in right. terms of presenting information for our uh, council packet. That was very interesting. Good evening, Mayor Hicks and council members. My name is Clint Laughlin. I'm the city's new housing program manager. The information I'm about to present has in the past been provided along with a separate housing program budget for council adoption. However, the housing budget was subsumed within the city's overall budget adopted in June, and so I'd like to take this opportunity to highlight some of the accomplishments from fiscal year 0506 and outline some of the activities we will be pursuing uh, now in fiscal year 0607. As you'll recall, council approved a new commercial linkage fee ordinance in March of 05. The ordinance requires a $5 per square foot um, fee for net new commercial developments over 1,000 feet and is designed to help offset the increased housing demand that results when businesses expand and require the hiring of additional employees. During the year, housing staff worked with other city departments and divisions to help familiarize them with requirements of the new ordinance and to create mechanisms for tracking commercial developments and their associated fees. No actual fees were collected in, t in fiscal year 0506. However, projects that were under review during that period are expected to generate approximately $28,000 in fees during fiscal year 0607. Those fees will be targeted for new construction activities. The inclusionary housing ordinance, which council adopted in 2004, requires most developers to either build affordable housing or pays fee pay fees in lieu of construction. In fiscal year 05-06, 82 affordable housing units were either approved, 
permitted or constructed. In addition, dollars in uh, housing fee, I'm sorry, in addition, the city collected $125,000 in in lieu fees and another $1.3 million in housing fees that were negotiated with the Mercer project prior to the adoption of the ordinance as part of their planned unit development approval. While we expect that some of the development projects from 0506 will complete construction in fiscal year 0607, it is difficult to, um, to project the actual numbers of units that will be generated as a result of the ordinance. Um, please note that $271,000 in in lieu fees shown here is a more accurate estimate than the figure shown in the staff report. Under new construction, I'd like to highlight four affordable housing projects that were in various stages of development during fiscal year 05, 06. Um, the projects are Casa Montego II, Acolanes Court, Villa Vasconcelos, and Las Juntas. Casa Montego II is a 33-unit, one-bedroom senior rental project located at 1485 Montego Drive, adjacent to Casa Montego I. It is being developed by satellite housing for very low-income residents, and the city has contributed $783,000 towards its construction. In fiscal year 0506, Satellite received a little over $1 million from the County Home Consortium, of which Walnut Creek is a member. In addition, Satellite was awarded $5.2 million in HUD Section 202 funds, which will enable the developer to subsidize rent so that the seniors pay no more than 30% of their income on rent. The HUD 202 funding will also allow them to be able to provide on-site support services for the seniors. Satellite is currently getting final construction estimates on the project, and if those estimates result in a financing gap, the developer may come back to the city to request additional funds. Acolanes Court, formerly known as La Hacienda or Trinity Avenue Apartments, is also being developed by uh, Satellite. This is a 17-unit rental project located at the corner of Trinity Avenue and Oakland Boulevard. It provides one, two, and three-bedroom apartments for low- and moderate-income families. The city contributed $1.8 million to this project, and the finishing touches are currently being completed. Ten families are scheduled to be moved in by the end of the week, and satellite is qualifying additional applicants for the seven remaining units from a waiting list of over 100 applicants. Villa Vasconcelos is a seven-unit rental project at 1515 Geary Road that is being developed by Resources for Community Development for low and extremely low-income seniors. The city contributed $1.4 million for construction costs in fiscal year, um, I'm sorry, for, um, for construction costs. In fiscal year 0506, RCD received a reservation of almost $8 million in state tax credits and $600,000 from the county home consortium. Demolition is currently underway on the vacant former Alzheimer's facility at the site, and construction is scheduled to begin in September. The development of the two-acre Las Junta Swim Club site is in the beginning stages. City staff is working with the county, which owns the land, to review proposals from potential developers, and we will try to ensure that the maximum feasible number of affordable units are included in the final project. The city's housing um, rehab loan program is administered by Contra Costa County. The program is designed to help low-income residents make their homes safe and habitable by offering low-interest loans for repairs. In fiscal year 0506, we budgeted $320,000 and provided five loans, spending approximately $255,000. For fiscal year 0607, the program has again been budgeted at $320,000 and no changes to the program are proposed. We anticipate being able to fund a minimum of six loans. The First Time Home Buyer Program provides loans to people who live or work in Walnut Creek. In fiscal year 0506, we were able to help seven households purchase homes in Walnut Creek, six below market rate units, five at Citrus Walk located at 3063 Citrus Circle, one at the Montecito located at 1315 Alm Avenue, and one market rate unit. Those funds totaled $359,660. The information just listed is different from the staff report, but is more accurate. In fiscal, um, in fiscal year 0607, we expect to be able to provide a minimum of seven loans utilizing a budget of uh, $400,000. The city's employee assistance program was developed as a recruitment and retention tool for current and prospective employees. The program provides loans to help city workers buy homes in Walnut Creek, and in fiscal year 0506, we were able to provide three loans. This program is offered on an equity shared basis, and any appreciation on the loan is paid back to the city and was returned to the program to assist additional employees. 
In fiscal year 05, um, 06, 07, we have funds for at least one loan at $45,000. In fiscal year 0506, the state removed all conditions on their certification of the city's housing element and commended the city for our housing development activities to date. The chart here shows the city's programs towards meeting our share of the regional housing needs as determined by the Association of Bay Area Governments. As you can see, we're almost at 50% of our goals, which shows that we have made significant progress, but that we also have work to do. Under the Community Development Block Grant and the Community Services Grant programs, the city budgeted a total of $478,000. Those funds were used by 23 nonprofit organizations to provide more than 5,000 units of service, spending approximately $250,000. An additional $180,000 was budgeted toward new construction funds that have yet to be allocated. This fiscal year, we have budgeted $433,000 and anticipate similar levels of service and activities. The state workforce housing grant is designed to reward jurisdictions for approving the development of affordable housing. In fiscal year 0506, the city received an award of just over $50,000 as a result of the city's funding of Akalina's Court. Margo Ernst, the city's housing and CDBG analyst, and I attended the award ceremony in Oakland last month, and here's a picture of Margo being presented with the check by Sunny Wright McPeak, Secretary of the Business, Transportation, and Housing Agency, and State Department of Housing and Community Development Director, Lynn Jacobs. In fiscal year 0607, staff will again apply for this grant, and if Casa Montego II and Villa Vasconcellos are able to pull their final permits this year, the city may qualify for as much as $100,000. As part of this year's work program, staff is drafting a density bonus ordinance as required by the state. The ordinance is designed to encourage this construction of affordable housing by allowing developers to build additional units above the maximum zoning allowance if they agree to include a certain number of affordable units in the project. A draft will be presented to the Planning Commission in September, the Housing Subcommittee in early October, and City Council for review and comment in late October. The final version is expected to be presented to Council for review and adoption in December. This ordinance will provide the city with yet another tool to help meet the city's affordable housing needs. That concludes my presentation this evening, except to request that City Council slash Redevelopment Agency adopt the resolutions that were present in the staff report that allow the City slash Redevelopment Agency to continue to contract with Contra Costa County to administer the Housing Rehabilitation Loan Program for fiscal year 06-07. And they for any questions. Thank you. That's a very good report. Uh, are there any questions uh, for Mr. Lofton? Lofton? One jumps out at me, Clint, uh, very thorough as usual from your group. Yeah. The question is, the, uh, as an example, the rehab loan program, we had budgeted 320,000, we spent 255. Does that unused money go into the council contingency fund or someplace <laughs> else? <laughs> I'm afraid not. Actually, um, the, um, the reason for that not being the full 320 is that there was an applicant that had applied for a loan for approximately $60,000 and then um, decided against it at the very last minute. I think it was like June 13th where they decided that they weren't going to be able to take advantage of those so funds. Do we then lose that money? No, no, no. no. That, that money will go into the pot for next year. It will stay in this the same year. fund? Right. It rolls, it, so it increases. Roll, right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That was it. Okay. Any other questions? No, just to comment, you mentioned uh, the DVD? Yes. No. Uh, watched it with Dick at home. And <laughs> <laughs> Did you have popcorn? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but he sat there and he was saying, hey, that's our program. I mean, Dick is with HUD. And so he said, that's my program. That's my program. So he took it to back. He's got it and he's taking it to work okay. to give to Steve Sachs. Okay. The DVD that Clint gave me was Superman Returns. <laughs> oh, wait, I'm going to get the other one and trade with you. <laughs> you want to hear something funny? I turned it on and I started watching it. I thought, gosh, this is a DVD of the city council meeting. And then I realized <laughs> I also had my, my tape in. <laughs> anyway, we'll get it straight at some point, Clint. Are there other questions? All right. No, I would move to approve we the need that We need public oh. comment. Does anyone from the audience care to address the council on this issue? If so, please step to the microphone. All right, seeing none, we'll close uh, 
this item and bring it back to council for a motion. Um, I would move um, to approve for both the city council and the redevelopment agency to uh, approve the contract with Contra Costa County to administer the housing rehabilitation loan program for fiscal year 0607. Second. I'll authorize the executive director to sign on yeah. behalf of. And just for the record, I know it's not clear clear in the staff report, but you're uh, moving to approve the resolution that does those activities. Right. There, That's what there. I said. Okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Can I make just one comment? I'm, uh, even though we haven't met all of the goals, I am very impressed with how much we have been able to provide for very low and low income housing. The moderate isn't quite as hard, although it's not, it's no picnic to try to get it. But for the very low and low, I, it's, it's quite remarkable. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, a lot of that is um, see our seniors rather than very many families or mm -hmm. or middle-aged people. So and it's not that they don't need it, it's just that it's interesting. And, and I would second that and, and offer a bit of an applause because earlier we had the, the, the number of consultants and staff that are working on the library doing a great thing for the community. Basically we have Clint and Margo doing a tremendous thing for our community and it deserves applause as well. Thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. Very, very challenging effort, and well done. And, and these people will be using the library. Of yes, course. of course. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah, we have to go back and applaud the Creek people. <laughs> yeah. Gave them ten thousand dollars. Oh, well then. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't vote yet, did we? No. On this, no. Well, we need to do that. All right. Sorry. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. All right. Motion Thanks carries. Thank you. Thanks for hanging out with us this evening. Yes. <laughs> okay, moving on to council member and staff announcements or reports. Uh, any over here? All right. Yeah. yeah. Yes, well, I had one that um, I wanted us to somehow, I think we all got a copy of a letter regarding uh, residential care facilities, and it is the second uh, time that this was brought to my attention just this year. Um, and I realize that um, the residential care facilities, much like the small child care facilities, um, we, the city has no control over. But there seems to be a proliferation of them within our neighborhoods, and it is affecting our neighborhoods. And I was wondering, um, I would like to ask that we perhaps put this on an agenda and get some, some more information as to how many, we can find out how many there are, who the deciding folks are, state or federal, that control this, and then perhaps take it to the mayor's conference if this council wants to take any action, and then maybe to the league or something to get some action to say, you know, that this is going on and it's not our jurisdiction too bad. Um, I think. And we've had some, you know, one lady that I talked to at a coffee this summer, she said, you know, she had tried. And she said, would you please talk to, you know, and it is easier for us to talk to the legislators. Uh, we know them, they will sometime, and we have referred this to Guy Houston's office. But I think if we looked at it and with a little more information, um, th maybe we can do something. I'd be happy to agendize it. I, I recently did some more research on past actions on the council's part and found a letter Gene Wolf wrote to um, different legislative representatives back when he was mayor on this very same issue with the very same concerns. Um, so I think this council has actively tried to act and influence the state on this in the past. Um, but I'd be happy to bring it back. And I feel I'm, I'm reading advice. this. At our request, Senator Rainey introduced legislation that would have established concentration limits on the number of these homes that could be established. However, the legislation was not adopted. I knew I liked that man. Uh -huh. Can I um, just add one thing here very quickly when you're finished? Uh, and that I had mentioned to you. Um, I'm going to ask Mr. Bayer-Riestra to do a little research because there is a case out of Washington State that does not allow uh, cities to um, tamp down on where they are located. 
It's a city in Washington, and this was, are you familiar with this, Mr. Barnes, at all? Yeah, in fact, we have a rather thick file on, on this very topic, um, so it's pretty common. I, I think having a meeting on Jensen, I go, it's, it's rather complex because there is an overlap between state and federal law that, that goes oh. into this. So I think having a separate meeting and going, and there is some recent case law that uh, causes more confusion, as, as Paul knows. So. Well, I assumed that it was a federal uh, court that had ruled in this case. That's why I, I, and if you already have a lot of it, Mr. Parnas, that would be very helpful. But I do think before we can say we're going to do what we can with the legislature, we better understand exactly what we can and cannot do and what law is, is in existence. Or whom we have to talk to to, to, to I, change it. I yes. think the intent is very good, but yes. what is happening now is this pro proliferation, and I think yes. it's, a, it's a different reaction than I think that they originally well, intended. Right, and I think that w the problem, at least in the Washington State case, was that they were all together. I mean, it's wonderful to have them various, you know, throughout the neighborhood, but all of a sudden you have a whole block that is nothing but nursing homes or yes. assisted living or whatever. So, yeah. Thank you. That's my request. Good point. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any, anyone else? Mr. Anyone? Okay. Well, I have a couple of things. Um, first, on Saturday night, the Walnut Creek Can Concert Band did us all proud. They had their summer concert at the Regional Center for the Arts, and it was uh, themed upon a musical circus. Mm -hmm. And they had a petting zoo at 7 o'clock. That is an uh, uh, instrument petting zoo. So the children actually got to come and feel the instruments, blow into them, or bang the bong, or ring the bell, or whatever it was. They had, they had a wonderful time. But then the entire band dressed up in uh, circus outfits and clown outfits and all and they all got into the spirit of it and of course when you have a circus you have to have a ringmaster which uh, wonderful conductor uh, yes R.V. Benstein R.V. Benstein he was mm -hmm. great and I will tell you they had many children there families it was fantastic and they had a standing ovation it, it was just a terrific evening of entertainment <laughs> And uh, of course, they will continue playing at the park and uh, through the summer and uh, Memorial Day. And they will have their winter concert, um, I believe it's late November, at the Regional Center for the Arts. Secondly, um, the Movies Under the Stars, which is sponsored by our Youth Council, is coming up in August. And it will be at Heather Farm Park. And uh, the movie will be Back to the Future. And th that's a lot of fun for people of all ages. So we're encouraging young people to go, but people of, of any age can attend, and this is being sponsored by our Youth Council. Um, I also would uh, like to remind everyone that uh, the one book, uh, one community, one book that was selected for everyone to read if they choose to in the community is The Namesake, a novel by Jhumpa Lahiri, who is a Pulitzer Prize winning author. And this book was selected as best book of the year by various publications such as the uh, New York Times and many others. Uh, so that's called The Namesake, and it's available at the library as well as local bookstores. And there will be a series of community activities around this uh, reading activity um, starting in the latter part of September and uh, going for about a month through uh, late October. Uh, so I encourage you if you want to have some uh, enjoyable summer reading and also some really fun uh, fall activities to get involved with that. Um, and then lastly, I would like to just uh, on a more business note, uh, talk about the League Annual Conference that is scheduled in September. Um, I have been named to the Conference Resolution Committee by the League President to represent the Community Services Policy Committee on which I serve. But I just recently, too late to get it on the agenda, had uh, sent to me a packet of the annual conference um, proposed resolutions. Now, there could be others that come in. And uh, so far, there are four resolutions. Two of them are more or less procedural, having to do with uh, the conference resolution procedures and the alternating vote, voting de delegate procedures. And then the Community Services Policy Committee uh, it is putting forward a resolution having to do with health and wellness programs in cities, and it will include a toolbox of um, 
uh, health and wellness programs such as uh, the one that we have right here in Walnut Creek. Um, then there's a public safety policy committee issue which has to do with the forfe forfeiture of vehicles used in illegal speed contests and exhibitions of speed. And what I propose is I will uh, have a copy of this put in your box and if there's something here that you have a uh, comment on, you would like to pass along to me. And then of course, Mr. Screll is our alternate uh, representative. That would be appreciated. These are pretty straightforward, I think. And lastly, we are going to, like many folks, take a summer vacation. And so we will now be on break until after Labor Day. And our next regularly scheduled meeting will be held on, um, I wrote it down, September, September 19th, Tuesday, September 19th. So there will be a lot of other community activities going on in the meanwhile, and we'll, some of us, uh, say all of us will be working uh, uh, behind the scenes. And I do wish all of you, though, a very, very happy summer. And this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>